Tihe, mauri ora tihe, uri uri tihe, noko noko katau hafakatau ko rangi nui e tui honei, katau hafakatau ko papatunu ko e tāko taua ke nei, katau hafakatau ko te mātuku mai, rarotonga ko ia uruku ia manawapau, roto ko ia uruku ia manawapau au. Kia tina, waka tina, te more i hua i ki e pupu ana huki e wāwau ana huki, tārewa tū ki te rangi, kia eke, eke pānuku, eke tangaroa, Tau mai te mauri, haumi e hui e, tāi ki e. E ngā mane ngā reo e ngā kāranga ranga maha. Mai te tai toke rau ki te tai rāwhiti, ma te tai rāwhiti ki te tai hauauru. Waka whiti te moana a rau kaua kaua ki te tau i hua te waka a Māui. Ki kā tiri tiri o te moana ki raki ura, ki ware kauri. E kui mai a koro mai te pō, moi mai, moi mai nā. Ko hoki mai au taku manu, ki tu tere mō ana ki kāpiti, ki whiti reia, ki rangi tuhi, ki puke atua, ki tangi te keo, ki mā tai rangi, ki puke ahu, ki ahu mai rangi. Ko hoki mai au, ki te tato o te pō, ki te puni rā, e kui mā e koroma, moi mai, moi mai nā. Ko tō rā, nō ngā hau e whā, Ki te epurangi, koto rā, nau mai, hara mai, whakatau mai. Whakatauria mai ki tēnei kaupapa, mō tēnei hui huinga, ara ko tae ao tangata hau ora. Ki o koto rā ngā pūkenga, ngā ahorangi, ngā tākuta, ngā kairanga hau, ngā toa, ngā mana wahine, a whaia ngā matua, nau mai, hara mai, tauti mai. Tauti mai ki te kaupapa nei, mō tātou. Ki te wehe wehe ngā, kai waenga o te iwi Māori, o te iwi Pākehā ngā tau iwi rā nei. O ngā uri, o te moana nui a kiwa. Kia neke neke mai tēnā wehe ngā. Kei raro te maru o te haura. Nō mātou mā, o tarana ki whānui, o ngati tōrang e te re mihi kawane tēnei ki a kūtou. Ko tō rā, kai mua i a kūtou te wero nei, kai mua i te aroaro o te kāwana, te kāwana hōpia, kā mau ki a itā ki tēna o tātou nei kui mā koroma. Ki te ahorangi, ki tā meihana jury. Ai ai ki ana ki tāna kōrero, ki tāna pūkinga, mo te haura tapawha, ka tui ai runga, ka tui ai raro, ko ia te wairua tanga te whakatīnanga, ka tui ai roto, te hiningaro, te ngākau māhaki, te ngākau kaha, ki o kuta nei kaupapa, ka tui ai waho, ko tō tātou nei, Waka whanaunga tanga, ki te ira atua, ki te ira tangata. Nō reira, ki ngā hāpuri o te au te aro, o te au rā nei. Nei rā te wero, ki a mātou, ka tukunu atu ki te kāwana. Tikina mai te nei wero, i a tau i a tau, ka puta mai ngā rangahau, ngā pūkenga, ke te mōhi o ke kōtou, ko tō rā, Ko koutou ngā pako ko tawhito mō tēnā huarahi. Nā koutou ka tukunu atu ki a rātou. Ka tīra, tēnei te mihi atu, hei tautoko, hei awhi, ka puta mai ki a koutou katoa. Ka tīra, mō tēnei wā ka tukunu he kare ki a mō tātou mō koutou nei hui huinga mō tēnei rā, mui nei rā, ka tai a tūnu mai. He hō nō re he korori e ki te atoa he mau ngā rungo ki te whenua he whakāro pai ki ngā tangata katoa. Aro haina ngā tuakana me ngā taina, kawehi ana ki te atoa, me whaka hō nō re ki te āri ki nui ko kingi tū heitia. E te āri ki nui ko koe te arawhata ki te hunga wairua nātou e noho mai ana i rotu i te wāhingaro. 
I puki ai te aka tāwhaki ki te toe o ngā rangi ki ngā rangi tua ngā huru ki ai o matua. Tēnei mātau o pononga tāne o pononga wahine ngā morehu o tēnei ao matemate. Te inoe atu ki a koe ki a tukua mai te wairu a māhaki ki a mātau e kūpapo atu nei. Ki moa ki tau au aroaro manā ki te amai mātau i rotu o mātau mau iwitanga, nau hoki i te rangatira tanga te kaha me te kororea mō ake tonu atu rire, rire, haupai mā rire. Ko tō rā, kei tēnei wā, e te mōhi o tēnei wai, he wai humārie mō tātou, ka hiki te wairua, ka tira he himini, he hōnore. E honore, e kororia, maunga rongo ki te whenua. Whakaro, pai e, ki ngā tangata katoa. Ake, 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 amine, te atua, te piringa, toku oranga, toku Kia tau ki a tātou katoa o te atawhai o tō tātou āri ki a ihu karaiti me te aroha ki te atua mene te whiwhunga tahitanga ki te wairua tapu, ake, 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 āmine. Tēnā tātou katoa, ka tuake nei he uri o Ngāti Toa Rangatiro o te atiawa, o kai tangata, o te mate hou, o Ngāti Tāwhiri Kuro, o Ngāti Te Whiti, kei te mihi, kei te mihi. Ko wai au, my name is Tōa Waka. Um, I'm here on behalf of our, our whānau, our local haukainga, uh, just to give you a blessing uh, to acknowledge the mana that is in the room and your knowledge that you are sharing both here in person and also uh, streaming live. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge it's a hard job ahead. Every year is a hard job when you create uh, research and all you want is your government to be able to take that research and put it into action. So uh, hopefully we throw the wheel every year to them and they can probably leave it some years, but let's try and make sure they really pick it up because enough is enough. Time is short. Hei tēnei wā Matariki. In this time of Matariki, the story of Matariki was tāwhiri mātea throws his eyes up into the, to the heavens for he is angry that his brothers and sisters have agreed to separate Rangi and Papa. In doing so, a widow is placed down and the story says that the widow is to all of those the line of Tumatauinga, the line of Tāne, that Tāwhiri Mātea will return every year again and again and that Matariki is to remind us of that. The changing times, the changing climates, uh, and the forces of nature that we live under. And so in this time of Matariki, it is right that wānanga like this help to uh, lighten that way and to realise you know, how quick things are happening these days. So I just want to acknowledge all the speakers. I'm going to go and take a seat. But I'd like to hand it over to David Geller, your MC for the day. Kia ora tato. Kia ora. Uh, kia ora toa. What a beautiful start to our two days. Um, to be reminded of the importance of the work that we all do and to acknowledge all of you for the work that you do. Um, my name's David Geller and I'm the MC for this meeting today. Um, and I want to welcome you to Tao Te, uh, Tangata Hawara, the 2023 Climate, Health and Sustainable Health Conference. Um, the goal of this meeting really is to extend our understanding of what's possible 
by embracing some of the enduring truths of Chiao Māori, through uh, learning more about mat maturangi Māori, in the hope that we will become better connected, more knowledgeable and more effective in our work to improve the well-being of both our people and our planet because they are intimately joined in their trajectories, good or bad. Um, it's been two years since our last conference, I think 2021, wasn't it? Yeah. And this is actually the fifth forum uh, that this group have organised. Um, there have been a few breaks because of pandemics and things like that, but it's kind of interesting to see the, um, how far uh, the group has come in their organising and how many more people are involved, and I know there's a lot of people in different parts of the country and we'll come and acknowledge them shortly. But there are a lot of people who have joined in this work and uh, it's now been uh, assimilated into the sort of the workings of Te Whatawara, which is a rather good thing. Kia ora. Should we wave? Let's wave. Cool. Um, so this has been uh, incorporated into the work of Te Whatawara, which is a really good thing. And hopefully over time will become assimilated into every aspect of what we do there. To those who have attended in the past, and I think there will be a few people here who have been to every single one of these forums, I know that the committee members have been involved in all of them, that's for sure. But it's nice to see familiar faces here um, from previous meetings, but also friends too, um, who share the same uh, mindset as so many people in this room. And it's really wonderful to see that. Um, our program will address a variety of different topics of mitigation and adaptation, uh, health and equity, focus on opportunity, research and innovation to create a better and safer future for all New Zealanders. That is our opportunity. Uh, time will be built into the program for some reflection and there's uh, lots of opportunities to talk about uh, the issues over the breaks, to collar the speakers and we'll make their details available to you over time. It's really great to have people in different parts of the country join us. There's a lot of people individually on Zoom joining us, but there are three hubs, um, Otutahi, Christchurch, Otipoti in Dunedin and Tamaki Makoro uh, in Auckland. There are people gathering uh, to take part in this meeting and hopefully participate as fully as the people here in the room. Um, the theme of the conference is Māori. It's the life spark or essence inherent in all living things and it's been passed down through our ancestors through whakapapa. Māori affects and is affected by the surrounding environment. They are intimately related. It is a motivating force and encapsulates a process of change from Māori moe, a state where potential is as yet unrealised, through to Māori ohu, sparks of interest and the realisation that change is actually possible, to Māori ora, an action-oriented stage of striving towards full potential. I think we're on that verge. We're striving towards full potential. You know, I think that's where we are today. There are four themes in this conference. Um, enhancing the Māori, and this is really about strategy. Restoring the Māori, this is about our physical environment. Protecting the Māori, this is more about risk and resilience and feeding the Māori. This is more about kai and food systems and, we'll, and these topics will be covered over the next two days. There will be a number of panel discussions um, at, uh, uh, addressing each of those topics as well as uh, a, a good number of keynote speakers uh, this morning and throughout the next couple of days. Um, we're going to be using Slido. Um, are you familiar with Slido? We've got some instructions, I think, that we can flick up on the, um, on the screen for Slido up there, I think. How we access that, there we go. Um, so I think that the idea is that, you know, when we have a lot of people in the room, um, the tendency is to uh, answer questions from people in the room, but there's a lot of people not in the room. So we want to really do that in a fair and even sort of way. So we're going to really try and go through the Slido app as best as we can. Um, and, and, um, and try and um, even out those questions from right around the country. So just visit slido.com, as you can see up there, enter the hashtag CHSH2023, or you can scan that code that you can see behind me, and that'll take you there directly. Uh, so myself as the MC this morning, Ken's going to do it this afternoon, there'll be 
and me again tomorrow, and moderators of the different panels will be using Slido as best we can. Um, I want to thank um, our sponsors, actually. Um, and actually, I should tell you actually about phones. So if you could put your phones on silent, that'd be really good, but use them, obviously. But before I go too much further, I want to thank our sponsors. Uh, and I want, to, I want to specifically thank Fisher and Paykel Healthcare Foundation. And I see the chair of their foundation, Tony Moyes, has just joined us. Uh, where are you, Tony? There you are. Thank you, Tony. And Nirali uh, Pabu, who's the executive director of uh, the Fisher and Paykel Healthcare Foundation, thank you very much for your support for this meeting and previous forums in the past. Fisher and Paykel have been a great supporter of this right from the get-go, which is fabulous. The Association of Salaried Medical Specialists is another um, you know, long-term uh, supporter of this meeting, and Sarah Dalton's not here today. I don't see her, Nate Branch is outside, but I want to thank her and her executive team. And Sylvia Boys is here representing them. Sylvia, where are you? Thank you very much for your support for this meeting. Um, also to Fata Ora are supporting this meeting, and um, Victoria Blake and Debbie and Dagan and others are involved in the, in the work with Te Fata Ora. And, uh, Peter Allsop is not here this morning, but he was with us last night. And thanks to them for their support for this meeting as well. Um, uh, the, uh, the Medical uh, Assurance Society is another supporter and have been for a while, and I want to thank them, and also Manatu Hawara, uh, the Ministry of Health, uh, have been great supporters of this meeting in the past as well. Um, before we go too much further, maybe we could just introduce the committee um, who have put this program together, and I'm going to ask them to stand, and uh, I'm going to embarrass them by asking them to briefly introduce themselves. And, Tell them, tell us where they come from and what they do. So I think we'll start with Summer, because she's looking so embarrassed. <laughs> and Summer, you're you're a PhD student at. Um, come on, tell us a bit more. <laughs> Thank you, Summer. Um, Stan, Stan, come on, you guys. <laughs> Victoria's up the back. Why don't you go next, Victoria? Sorry, Introduce yourself quickly. Cool. Debbie? We've got a microphone, sorry about that, that's my bad. I'm Helen Polly, the Sustainability Lead at Counties Manukau. Welcome all. And pass it over. Actually, um, I'm an I'm Modi Orokoto. My name is Ken Taipa. I'm part of the committee. I'm a postdoc research fellow at the Uni of Otago and Massey, and I'll be your MC this afternoon. So I won't tell you too much about myself, just you. Kia ora. Oh, kia ora, Ken. Thanks, man. Yeah, that's good. Cool. Right. Um, there are some health and safety notices that I need to tell you about. Um, I'm just pulling them up because they're quite, kind of complicated, but um, there's exits that you can see, okay? There's lavatories through those doors there. Um, there's also lavatories when you go out into that main foyer to the left and right. The ones on the right may be not functional. The ones on the left round the corner are, but there's definitely a couple of loos out that way, okay? Um, I think if you're feeling unwell and you might have COVID, you should go home. <laughs> and if you're just anxious, you know, because actually anxiety is a problem these days for many of us, you know, there's, um, there are masks and hand sanitizers at the door, you know, so they're kind of good to have if you, if you feel anxious um, or someone's spluttering or you feel like you're going to start spluttering yourself. Um, there's going to be food at morning tea and lunchtime, and I presume it's going to be just outside, yeah. Yeah, so there'll be good kai today, so, you know, don't eat between meals and just save it up for that because it'll be worth it, okay? Um, and uh, the last thing to talk about are fires and earthquakes, and I'm going to read to you um, the health and safety notice that comes um, with this place. 
So if you hear a continuous sounding of the fire alarm, don't linger, leave the building out there and through the doors out onto the street or out that way into the, into the foyer. Uh, don't attempt to return. Don't run, keep calm. Don't use the lifts. Um, keep left on the stairs. Don't return to the building until the all clear is given and assemble at this assembly point, which will be outside. And um, this is Wellington. Um, so, you know, when I was young, I grew up here and there were earthquakes quite a lot. There don't seem to be so many these days. They seem to be in other places. Um, but if there was to be an earthquake, um, drop to the ground and get under cover as best you can and hold still until the shaking stops. If there's no cover, crouch on your knees on the floor away from the windows and put your arms over your head and neck to protect them. Should we all pretend? No. <laughs> Thank you, Sylvia. <laughs> she gave me the evil eye. <laughs> OK, and after an earthquake, stay inside and gather everyone in one place until it's safe to exit. If you're in a multi-story building, this is one. Check the stairs before making your way to the lower floors. If you're in stairwells, use the emergency door release buttons to exit. If your building is unsafe, evacuate. Take your belongings. OK, I think that's enough, isn't it? Okay, all right. Okay, um, we're going to go on to our very first session uh, for the morning now. Um, and uh, this, uh, this morning we're going to be devoting ourselves to the first of those uh, four themes, um, enhancing the Māori. It's about strategy and the ways we conceptualise health and climate change. It's critical to first understand what is happening and then be able to address it and the ways that Māori can be enhanced through our actions. So there's going to be three speakers in this session and then a, a panel session in the hour before lunch um, uh, with a morning tea break in between. Um, and in our first, um, our first speaker is um, a really accomplished person um, who has been uh, a speaker here before, India Miro Logan Riley was raised in the Hiratonga Plains, a bountiful place, circled by mountains and the rising Pacific Ocean. The Mokapuna of Ngāti Kahununu, Orongo Mai Wahini and Arangitane. India is a climate justice organiser at Action Station that many of you will know, a multi-issue campaigning organisation in Aotearoa, New Zealand. They also work as a community researcher for Generation Kainga, a project uplifting the aspiration that young Māori have for diverse housing that takes into account culture, resilience and climate change. India brings a background in heritage spaces and lived experience of climate injustice, drawing on a broad range of experiences from UN climate negotiations to grassroots work on land back campaigns with young Māori and Pacifica. India dreams of resilient communities where everyone is safe and joyful. India, floor's yours. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I did send in some slides very early this morning. <laughs> the RSVP email address? Is that, that was the one that said in the, I can resend it. So sorry guys, <laughs> bear with me. Um, no, don't. So sorry guys, one second. Um, I just have to talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> oh, if I can, oh, I need it for my notes. Yeah, sorry. Sorry guys, <laughs> this is my muck up.
people why they're here. And, um, and, I, and I, I think just, you know, don't get embarrassed by it, you know, just tell me, you know, um, tell the audience why you're here, why you're interested in this, what, what you hope to gain from coming here for the first, for this, and whether you've been to one of these conferences before. Uh, I'm going to go to you with the ticket to the dinner tonight. Gemma, Gemma, tell us about yourself and why you're here and what you hope to learn. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. <laughs> Um, so I'm from Auckland, I'm studying um, psychology, but I'm also working as a junior research analyst for Carbon Market Solutions. Um, and I, yeah, I really want to learn more about things that I don't know in terms of sustainability, like I just learnt before, the difference between um, climate, um, what was it called? Climate yeah, health. climate and planetary health, so I thought that was quite interesting. Kia ora. Um, yeah, I'm Donald. I'm a final year med student um, who's doing my placement, my elective placement at uh, Manatu Haora. Um, so yeah, climate change is obviously going to become a huge part of all aspects of health, medicine, um, and I want to be prepared for that. And I, yeah, that's why I'm here today. <laughs> I just wanted to help some of you. Um, <clears throat> when we talk about Modi, everyone say Modi. Mo. Ri. Modi. Kapai? Yeah. Ma Udi. Ma Udi. Yeah. Say Modi Ora. Now say Tihe Modi Ora. Okay, we're saying the sneeze of life. The sneeze of life that came at the very beginning. So while we're talking about Matauranga Māori, I guess it might be important for us just to remember Māori order comes from that first time, that first essential breath of life in the stories, our pūrāko, our, our own environmental science knowledge of te ao Māori, where tāne māhuta, tāne te wai ora, ka puta mai, breathe the first sneeze of life into hine ahone and begat humanity. So, tihe, kia ora. Kia ora toa. thank you. I think India's ready to go. Paul. Yeah, um, koutou. thank you Toa for that. Good to make space for that kōrero. I <laughs> love a bit of spontaneous mātauranga sharing and um, aroha mai whānau for that um, hiccup on my part. Um, so, um, yeah, I'll just I guess, yeah, kick us off. Um, firstly, ko ai um, ko kahurani ki tōku maunga, ko tuki tuki roa, ko uh, ngaru roro oku awa, uh, ko uh, taki timi roa, ko kuruhopo oku waka, uh, ko Ngāti Kangunu, rongo mai wahini rangitāne oku iwi, ko Ngāti Hawea, uh, Fatu Yapti Oku Hapu, uh, Ko Kauraniki, Ko Waipatu, Ko Te Pairo, Ko Rua Hapia, Ko Kohupatiki Oku Marai, uh, Ko India, Miro, Logan Riley, I hope. Um, so my name's India, as was said. Um, of course, thank you so much for having me back. It's always nice to be back in this space. And I did work at Otago briefly for a little bit. Well, it's strange to be in a different campus this time. Um, nice to change it up. And of course, um, my mum works at the university as well, so it's, this feels a little bit like family. Um, yeah, my pronouns are they, them, and as was said, I work at Action Station and at Purangakura, um, which is an independent Māori research centre um, under the guidance of Jenny Lee Morgan and Ro Hoskins, um, working on rangatahi aspirations and housing. Um, it's a really exciting new project. Um, and yeah, thank you all for having me. Thank you, Tor, for welcoming us into this space. Uh, it's lovely to see you again from my Otago family. Thank you. Um, what I wanted to do today, and of course apologies for those who've heard me speak before, I will be covering the same old stuff a little bit, but I tried to bring some fresh analysis as well. Is there's going to be so many good, juicy details over the next coming days. Um, on what we can do in detail. So I thought what I could do is set a bit of a scene setting, set a bit of a, a foundation for the conversations going forward. So it will be quite broad, um, but I hope that means then that there are little pieces for everyone um, that are useful um, to take forward. Um, so 
Of course, um, we start where we always have to start as Māori, and that is whakapapa. Um, and so, I'll just press the button. Yeah, cool. It's really important when we're talking about climate change, that we're talking about how we got here. What actually happened? Why are we here in this room today rather than at our mahi or hanging out with our family or travelling or anything else that you could be doing? Instead, we're gathered here in this room. Um, and to take it down to its most simplest form, for those of you who maybe didn't grow up with an understanding or an immersion in whakapapa, um, is, as it was explained to me um, by Komato that I was lucky enough to learn under, is that it is what are the phenomena that come together to create the circumstances that we're in now, that come to create us. And in its most simplest form, it's you know, one plus one equals two or one plus one equals five, depending on which pūrāko you're listening to. Um, or it could be something like ice, or water and ice, water and cold makes ice, so you've got something and something equals something else. And that nothing can exist without whakapapa. Nothing can come to be without whakapapa. And we understand that in multiple realities. There are origin stories of rangi and papa, as was mentioned this morning, but also in our inquiry to understand dark matter and the Big Bang, that there is origins and origins and origins. And we hopefully, through our journeys of living and through intergenerational knowledge, can have a good sense and grounding um, within that whakapapa. And so that's what I'm going to talk a bit about today, but of course, being Māori, whakapapa is intensely place-based. I'm here because of multiple generations of tipuna, of ancestors, but I'm also here because um, the lands and waters that loved me and nourished me um, have come into being as well. And that our whakapapa is intertwined, that our legacies of being in, in creation and being created are intertwined, and that creates relationships of obligation over time. And so, uh, for me, um, a, an example of this, an example of, I guess, the power of whakapapa and its momentum is um, what has happened in Hawke's Bay recently, where I'm from. Now, you see the picture on the left is um, before colonisation. Um, and so, actually, Napier Hill, if you've been to Napier, was more of an island, and there were pa all around the inland area, and that oh, why did you do that, um, that where the airport is was an inner harbour that there were all sorts of settlements around the edge of the harbour. Granted, there was, of course, an occurrence, something that happened. Um, Ruo Moko did a little bit of a rumble and we had the 1931 earthquake. And so they also lifted the land, but also the land was drained during colonisation. And of course, what we saw with the cyclone is that water has its own whakapapa and it had a momentum to it and a returning to where it was and we had the floods. And so what we can then understand is that over time as we generate more relationships through landscapes and with each other that that carries us forward. And so I can't talk about how we came to be without talking about, about this landscape on the left where the water was safe enough to swim in and drink, um, where there was enough food for whoever was at the table and anyone else who arrived, um, where the whakapapa that we were generating was born of extensive relationships over hundreds of years, but also that it was born of generating good outcomes, right? generating positive impacts and, and outcomes, seeking greater and greater well-being for ourselves and our more than human whanonga over time. And of course then, with the arrival of colonisation, that creates whakapapa of harm and legacies of hardship and disruption. And of course I'm going to continue with the place-based corridor here to start to tell a bit of a story about the East Coast and some of those harms, those legacies of harms that have brought us here today. And of course, one, the top one will know, or some of us will know quite well, New Zealand Settlements Act. If the Crown decides that you were in rebellion against the Crown, then your land gets taken, right? And there's no court process for that. There's just, they decide. Um, and of course, specific to the East Coast is the East Coast Land Titles Investigation Act. 
um, which basically was when they found oil on the East Coast, um, they passed that legislation to take the land from Māori while they decided which local government entity got to decide which company to contract to extract the oil. But they knew first and foremost, oh, we've got to disrupt that Māori whakapapa and we've got to take it for ourselves. And of course, we're very lucky that there was too much raru within the Crown for them to decide who got to contract which company. So the oil actually never got extracted. So hooray for that. <laughs> but it, the land was not, never returned. So um, again, that then cements legacies of disconnection of a different kind of relationship with the landscapes and waterscapes in Aotearoa. And if we move forward, um, a considerable amount to this court case. And this is where I come in as a 10 year old, as a six year old, as a little kid. Um, the Guayan and Or v. Hastings District Council. Basically, what happened in the late 90s, the early 2000s, is Hastings District Council decided they wanted to build a motorway. Um, and that they wanted to use the Public Works Act um, to take that land from the last intact Māori land block in Hastings called the Karamu land block. And that's where my marae is, Waipatsu. That's where my grandma lives a few doors down. Um, it's where we have an apple orchard um, that employs our people. Um, and so what ended up happening was that it got taken to court and then it got taken to the High Court and then it got taken to the Court of Appeals and then it got taken to the Privy Council which was the highest court at the time that since changed. And unfortunately that court case was lost on a technicality around the jurisdiction of the Māori Land Court but it essentially get, was the Crown back in London saying, yeah, you can go ahead with building this motorway. And I hope you can see the synergies here, right, that we have a whakapapa of harm embedding itself over time with the arrival of the Crown, the displacement of Indigenous peoples, um, the, the taking of land, that then will create circumstances for increasing emissions, right? Like building a motorway is going to increase emissions. Um, and it was to deal with traffic. Hawke's Bay doesn't really have traffic, but that's a different discussion. Um, and so what ended up coming out of that, though, was the Privy Council recommended going back to the submissions process. And so that's um, what ended up happening at our marais. There were oral submissions. And that's where I walked down with my grandma as a little kid to go and listen to our komatsu talk about when they would walk between Hastings and Napier with their parents and their grandparents. And how their parents and grandparents would cry as they made the journey because they would say, you know, where that wool works is now is where your auntie used to live. Or where that boat shed is now where we used to fish for flounder. Right? That not only that there's a physical cost and that there's a cost to the climate, but there's an emotional cost as well that perpetuates over time. And that for myself, I was entering into a relationship with that grief and that pain through it continuing to be done by the Crown. And so we can see, of course, the ripple effects and the relationships across um, Aotearoa, unfortunately this is just Te Iko Maui, um, but I can say the same for Te Waiponamu, is that there is a relationship between land theft and our highest emitting industry, which is agriculture, right? The majority of stolen land is used for farming now, and that is just simply a fact. And there are very complicated factors around that, but in terms of being able to name whakapapa and outcomes of whakapapa, that is very clear. And where you have your most violent taking of land, so the displacement of people um, through things like the land wars versus some of the tricky uh, legal complexities that happened in the likes of Kahungunu, um, is also where we have our biggest embeddings of the agricultural industry in Waikato and Taranaki, and of course the, the um, oil extraction industry in Taranaki as well. And of course then, this comes forward into our lifetime, into my lifetime as I grow older. Um, so when I talk to my little sister who's 10 years younger than me about what, when she first remembers climate change, um, she thinks of this storm that happened when she was about three or four years old. And we saw the house that used to be where this couch is get pulled into the ocean just down the road from my mum's house. And of course, since then, that house in the picture is gone and the 
in the edge, and then the house on the other side is also gone as well. It's all been replaced by a sea defense wall. And so we see, we see the costs emerging in places where colonization took place is also where these major impacts are happening. And then, of course, um, we can't talk about, I guess, like places and people without talking about what Naomi Klein calls sacrifice zones. And this is like an additional layer of analysis I think is really important to understand. I'll let you um, read the quotes, but it's basically this understanding that in order for colonial capitalism to stay entrenched, the costs are outsourced to certain communities and certain places. Right, and Hawke's Bay is one of them. Aotearoa is one of them in the mechanisms of empire, in the layout of empire. And that's how it was originally envisioned. And of course, it was a place for those who were experiencing economic oppression in the UK to come here and have their own access to a kind of landed gentry lifestyle. And that's what we see in some of the ways in which people are very attached to land and which Pākehā are very attached to private property and land here in Aotearoa. And these are big words, these are big concepts. We're covering a lot of history here. There's whole PhDs in some ways, but um, I just hope that some of those seeds can be placed. And we understand this as well. We can see, of course, with the tar sands in Canada, with the logging in the Amazon, that there are places that are identified to be sacrificed so that we can maintain our current state of harm. And of course, it also impacts people. Oh, did that? Is this still working? Yeah. Um, and we saw that with the cyclone, um, that the, our, the, our whanonga from the Pacific were left on roofs, were left completely stranded without access to support services and community help. But it is something that in Aotearoa's relationship or the New Zealand government's relationship with the rest of the Pacific, that we extract the labor of people as well. This is one of my favorite signs from one of the school climate strikes. Um, during a time when um, those who run the orchards in Hawke's Bay were complaining about not having enough workers, not wanting to pay workers more, provide better working conditions as well. Um, so I love that for our young people, is actually just pick your own fruit then. Um, and again, seeing those ripples effects and those relationships which will continue to emerge unless we can talk about completely reshaping systems. And I don't know, again, these are big frameworks. Again, that over the next couple of days, you'll get more details from other folks. But I guess the, the question now that we arrive at is, if injustice is how we got here, if um, the, implement, the violent implementation of crown ideology, of colonial ideology, is how we got here, then what is the other side of the coin? What does justice look like in this context? And if clim climate change is an outcome of injustice, then what is a justice that, that captures the healing of our climate and our people and of the harms of our past? How do we disrupt a whakapapa of harm that has so much momentum to it. Now, um, I'm gonna, usually I ask a bit of a question here, but we're gonna speed on through. <laughs> I'm gonna give you a definition of climate justice. That is one of my favorites from a group called Uplift Climate that are based in the US, organizing young people of color um, in local communities there. So climate justice makes climate change a social issue by centering frontline communities and acknowledging power structures while dismantling exploitative and harmful institutions in order to respect life. And that's the really key bit here, is that ultimately this is a struggle for power. And how do we distribute power? How do we have reciprocal relationships of power? How do we have the power in our own communities to do the healing and change that has to happen? And we can feel it, right? Like, I remember during COVID when it, actually the safest thing to do was stay inside and not hang out with other people, but the only everyone was like, but the economy, though we have to keep going out and working. It's like the power didn't sit within our own communities to actually say, hey, no, we're not going to do what's bad, we're going to just stay in our homes and do what needs to be done to look after everyone. And we're not going to lose our houses because of that, because things like rent and economic structures remove power, right? And so what does it mean to redistribute power? And of course, we're really lucky in Aotearoa that we have frameworks like Te Tiriti or Waitangi to structure that well, intergenerational documents that envisioned a good whakapapa for all of us. And of course, 
Justice isn't abstract, it isn't valueless. It looks different in different cultural contexts. And I love this quote by Dr. Cornel West, who's a civil rights um, advocate and academic in the US. He talks about um, justice is what love looks like in public. Um, and the other side of that quote is tenderness is what love looks like in private. Okay, and so, but in, in public spheres, when we structure when we look at justice, it is about loving each other fiercely um, and making sure that we build whakapapa around honouring that. Now, of course, justice in a colonial sense means something very different. And again, that's a whole other PhD, so I'm not going to go into it. Um, but just bear that in mind, that this is what it takes to love each other. Now, these again are all very abstract, um, but I'm going to pivot us quite roughly um, to a bit of an analysis of the situation um, that we're in now. Because I think it's all well and big talking about these big frameworks, but what is, what is the situation we're in now? What is the political situation we're in now? Because I know you'll go back into your mahi, and you'll do the things that you're doing in your work, but also we are more than just our mahi, we are interconnected social beings. And so what does the larger landscape look like that we are doing our mahi within? Um, and so I want to talk about the political lay of the land as it stands now. Of course, the conversation around climate change has really shifted. It has shifted massively because of the cyclones and the floods. And I don't think we can talk about what happened on the East Coast and Northland and Tamaki Makoto without acknowledging that people died because of that whakapapa of harm. Right, that international dynamic of empire building has then manifested itself in community members who are lost because of the floods. And that is, that's heavy, right? That's, that's hard to think about and sit with. And it is the reality of what we're sitting with. And it is unfortunate. And yeah, I've got stronger words to say about that, but then I was like getting emotional. It is horrible um, that it took deaths to shift the climate conversation, um, particularly in the crown political space. I do really want to acknowledge here that Māori have been talking about climate change for like uh, hundreds of years. Um, and ultimately what we're dealing with is, is bad governance on the part of the state. Um, but it has really changed the conversation, particularly in terms of, oh, we need to invest in infrastructure now. And that's really shifted the tone. And then, of course, um, we have things like the Zero Carbon Act. We have things like the Emissions Reduction Plan. We have the Equitable Transition Plan that's being drafted up. The RMA is being replaced. But consistently throughout these documents, you'll never hear them talking about why we got here. And it doesn't make sense to me and how I was raised to talk about solutions without talking about why we got here and how we got here, because then how are we actually meant to address them? And a lot of that is um, tiptoeing around the political nature of naming colonization and naming that as a harmful force because the New Zealand state is still aspiring towards innocence and an, and an aversion to justice. Um, but it is also really important if we're going to spend billions of dollars heading in certain directions that we get it right um, and that no one is left behind because that's ultimately the cost of if we don't heal harm um, that has been done that harm will continue to take place. Um, and so, it's election year. I can't talk about politics without talking about election year. Also, my boss at Action Station will like, tell me off. Um, this is everything that is our work right now. Um, and we can't get away from any conversation about any policy without acknowledging the fact that it's election year. Um, and of course, uh -huh the rising cost of living, um, the uh, inability to have secure housing, um, the ongoing pollution of our rivers. We're just seeing all these coalescing bad features that sit at the core of um, Western styles of governance or colonial styles of governance. Um, and that's wearing, not, and again, as I talk about, you know, this doesn't just have a physical cost, but it has an emotional, spiritual, and social cost as well. Like I can imagine all of you who work in health after COVID, exhausted, still exhausted, and we're still battling with it, 
and we haven't seen those systemic shifts that need to happen. And that continues to wear down in our bodies and in our families and the places and people that we love and care about. And of course, opportunities. <laughs> You're going to see this, climate justice comes up every time. So because the conversation has shifted, we have windows through which things can come. Right, where if we're ready with the right plans and policies, that they are windows into, I guess, the opportunity to take a breath and set forward on a new pathway. And I do really want to name here that there is, growing particularly amongst young people, and I love this, a dedication and a love for things like te tiriti and healing the harms of the past and honouring Indigenous rights and looking after everyone. And I think that's really incredible and I want to name that and acknowledge it. Sometimes we get a bit caught up in, oh, but how do we be the best ally? And I think that's really important, but there is a deepening desire and a shift towards that allyship. And of course, we've been living this uh, free market experiment for a couple decades now, a few decades. It's not working. Uh, inequality is getting worse. Um, hardship's getting worse, of course, across certain people and places. And so what I've seen in my work is an appetite for something new and different and better. Um, and then, of course, the eternal opportunity, right, to fully embrace the aspirations that were embedded in Te Tiriti or Waitangi and what that meant for all of us being able to be taken care of, to live into a rela um, relationships of obligation which will then love and nourish us in return, and that that can be sustained for future generations as well. I can't talk about Te Tiriti or Waitangi without talking about Matiki Mai, um, which I'll skim over, um, but definitely do look it up. It is the most beautiful document that lays out a kind of constitutional transformation so we can head towards better governance structures um, that allow us to tackle things like climate change and have better health at the same time. Can't talk about opportunities without talking about threats. <laughs> Disasters again. Um, again, Naomi Klein talks about this disaster politics um, where those who are resourced with plans and aspirations for deeper embedding of, of capitalism, have the plans ready to go when a disaster hits and government's looking around for something. The um, employment wage, or the employment wage subsidy that happened during COVID was the one that went forward because it was the first plan put on the table by Business New Zealand. It was not put on the table by workers, it was not put on the table by poor people, it was not designed to be equitable, it was the first plan on the desk, and so that's what had to be run with. And so, that's where we also have to be really careful in times of crisis, the way that they will be taken advantage of to advance more harmful policies. Um, yeah, we can't talk about politics in this country without talking about the growing influence of the far right. We have this person going around doing a tour against co-governance right now. Um, we have him calling for people to take arms against Māori for an impending civil war. Um, and I think we need to take this seriously and credibly um, because probably the government won't take it seriously until it's too late. And so this is where conversations with your racist uncle are really important. Use those whānau relationships to try and shift that. Um, because as we've seen with the Supreme Court in the US, there are ways in which the politics over there will influence the politics here. And it, will become more dangerous. Ugh, heavy stuff. Um, economic hardship. Um, in times of economic stress, it's really easy to default to, oh, but I, I have to look after just what's mine. I won't think about the whānau that's going through hardship down the street. And so an economic anxiety is leveraged really well by political parties for their aspirations. And we see that particularly with farmers and opposition to climate action, where their economic and emotional hardship that our rural communities are going through are then channeled towards opposing climate action rather than thinking about, oh, hey, actually, what would help us all flourish in this situation as well as reduce emissions? Um, and the last thing is that we have had wins. We do get little wins all the time, and I want us to be excited about that. The offshore oil and gas ban is incredible. 
It was internationally groundbreaking, and I want us to celebrate the win of that. But also, sometimes when we win, we're tired, first and foremost, because that's a fight. And also, we might be like, okay, now we've made progress. Surely we won't slip. And actually, things can slip, and we have, again, seen that in the US. We've seen some of it here with Chris Hipkins just, like, burning every climate policy left, right, and centre, including ones that had, like, 98% public support, like the container reimbursement scheme. So I just want us to be... I don't want us to get paranoid and be stuck in defence mode all the time, because that's not a healthy place to be. It's not good for campaigning and political activism. But it is important that we acknowledge what we have to keep defending as well, especially because it's election year. And certain political parties have said they get rid of the offshore oil and gas ban if they get elected. Woo! Um, so these are big, big topics once again. Big thoughts, big feelings, and there will be far greater detail to come to you that's way more useful, but I just want us to remember how we got here. Right? And so that what we call for has to be as ambitious and rise to the challenge of healing what has happened in the past. Um, and I think for more concretely, where to from here? Have conversations with your families, with your community. It is election year. Roll to vote. Um, and also, I guess, just like join a group, become involved in a community that's doing stuff because action is the quickest pathway to pathway to hope, um, and it is something that can continue to inform moving forward that we can be hopeful when we're getting out there and we're doing the thing that our bodies and our minds and our hearts yearn for and know is better for us and better for everyone and better for the places that we come from. Now, we've really been on a journey. <laughs> I've covered a lot of content, a lot of big ideas, and hopefully there's been something useful in there. Of course, I, it's my campaigner brain. It goes lots of places all the time, and hopefully some of that came out into like understandable sentences. Um, last thing I want to say, particularly in this new political environment that we're in after these disasters um, that come on the heels of over 100 years of, of disasters, um, is a thank you to everyone who's here for showing up and being a part of this conversation. And I want you to take strength and reassurance and knowing that there are people out there all across the world who are also fighting back against empire, who are doing their best and their hardest to reduce emissions in their own backyards, because that will inevitably end up benefiting us. Um, and that that is reassuring and encouraging for us to keep going as well, to keep doing the little bits and pieces. Because, see, like of a lot of social change also just looks like Zooms and writing lists and doing those like real little mundane things, but it means a lot. And, you know, for this place that has loved and nourished me and my family for so many generations, the one that I will continue to show up in, in these kinds of ways as my way of loving and nourishing it in return. Um, this place that hopefully future generations will continue um, to be able to love and nourish and experience that love and nourishment in return. I just want to say thank you um, because you showing up here and being in this mahi um, literally means the world to me and my whanau and my community and my marae. So, Thank you very much, um, and have a lovely couple of days. Um, yeah, kia ora. Any questions? Yeah, um, what a beautiful um, person you are. <laughs> and so wise, you know. I mean, that was a fabulous way to start this meeting. You know, I'm kind of really quite moved, I mean, exceptionally by you know, the wisdom of what you had to say, but how you said it as well. You know, whakapapa, you know, it's a beautiful thing. We can't fix where we are until we know the story of how we got here. You know, it's a, it's a lovely, it's a really useful and very helpful analogy, you know. We haven't got a lot of questions on Slido. I'm just going to encourage people to put them on. Uh, you can do it any time during the talks. I'm going to just, um, I'm going to say a couple of things too, uh, just to... The, about the, this work um, that we're all involved in, and I think that everyone who's just heard India now, whether you're here in the room or around the country, will have felt something quite powerful 
um, I think. And, you know, there's something about this work. You know, I did 32 years in the ICU at Middlemore Hospital, and it was kind of extraordinary work, actually. It was fabulous working with uh, individual patients and their whānau in the community. But it was really hard work, but it actually was that relational aspect of the work that actually was sensational. It was the toughest thing. And then, you know, but probably the most rewarding thing that I ever got involved with is this work, actually, and the, with the group that started back then in 2010, 2011, and how it's blossomed into this wider movement of people, you know, working for people and the planet, recognising that those two are so intimately connected together and how optimistic that is. Um, you talked a lot about, um, well, you mentioned allyship, and you talked about this being an election year. Uh, you know, sometimes, you know, for people, it's bigger than Bertha, isn't it? You know, and you've sort of mentioned some of the aspects of what individuals can do, but maybe just go over some of those things, India. You know, mm -hmm. to help people, uh, to, to to give them some guidance about, you know, we're not alone in this. What are the things that we can do um, mm -hmm. to, to 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 sort of you know really mobilise our voices much more strongly? <laughs> Yeah, um, there's always a, a bunch of things and it really depends, rests on who you already have existing relationships with. Um, things like doing get out the vote work, encouraging people to vote are really hard to do if you don't have people who are from the community doing it um, over several years. It's really hard to do like six months out, three, with three months out, my boss just reminded us um, on Monday, so three months out from the election, um, no stress. Um, I think it is first and foremost with your family, with your existing communities, having those hard conversations, but coming from a, a values-based place and um, there is this organisation called The Workshop that has really good guides on how to talk about issues from a way that it fits with the psychology of how the brain works and what we're receptive to being persuaded by over time. Um, so I highly recommend checking those out. And um, yeah, taking a big breath and being patient um, sometimes with maybe those political disagreements. Um, there is this really good course called Toi We Totoko that is centered around helping folks who want to be um, allies deal with online racism, particularly in the comment section, but also does um, fosters other opportunities to be involved with things um, to push back against, particularly the anti-Maori racism, but also just general racism. Um, and then things like if you're feeling really passionate and frustrated about an issue, like write a letter to the editor, like those kinds of things. Just like get it out um, and, and, and share that because you can, you can be guaranteed that there is a whole machine of anti-climate action, anti-people, anti-planet, um, people who are there with messages ready to go um, and uh, are being paid to proliferate those things as well. So yeah, first family and community. Um, and then when it comes to the actual election time period, if you do want to go to community meetings, even if you don't agree with the political party, you can go to their community hall meeting and ask them some spicy questions, just to nudge them. Um, but typically don't do that on your own, um, because it can be unsafe, and I will, I will name that. Um, and of course, post-election, we have to be ready to go whatever happens afterwards. Um, and so um, don't burn yourself out trying to change the world through the election, but sustain ourselves through the election so we can continue to do the work either way. And whatever the outcome is, it's what can you commit to to transform those who are in your whare, in your street, in your block, and then your suburb, and then your city, um, and then your country. Um, as of course is said, you know, small is all. Start where you can. You don't have to be this person who comes out with a full-blown manifesto to change the world in the next week. Please don't. Because we know actually from reading history and reading stories that it's groups of people that have done the big things, um, not just single charismatic leaders. Yeah, I hope that answers. That's a fabu fabulous answer, India, and um, we're, we're getting a few questions through now, and um, I think that that answered one of the questions there. Um, another one, I think we'll just go on for a few more minutes, if that's okay with you guys. Um, there was one where you, you talked about uh, a question says, that was a wonderful talk, thank you. 
Um, what is the equitable transition plan you mentioned in passing? Yeah, it's this interesting piece of work that's being done. It's a combination of ministries, but it's basically um, the government's first step towards how do we shift the whole of society. So, of course, there's contributions from MSD, um, from MPI, so Ministry for Social Development. You know, what does it look like for benefits? What does our welfare system look like? What does it look like for workers and retraining them? Um, so the unions are quite involved. Business New Zealand is also quite involved, um, and there will be opportunities for input. Um, it is currently in draft form. I don't believe it's been released. It was meant to be released by now, but I think they're really trying to get it right. A word here on words. What we talk about in particularly the union space, the workers' rights space, and in the ind indigenous space is a just transition. Right, capturing that justice, that healing the harms of the past, bringing everyone along, not just throwing poor people and disabled people and indigenous people into the fire pit as all the rich people get away with what they did. But to make it more politically palatable, I guess, the government has reworded it to be an equitable transition. And so I think it's important here to say like, hey, Remember that it's meant to be a just transition and don't get caught up in that word equitable because it's just trying to be a euphemism for justice and so to hold on to that justice piece. Um, yeah, that's what the just transition, equitable transition plan is. Kia ora and yeah, um, thank you very much. Um, just one last thing. You've talked about lots, a, a great list of things that people can do. Someone wants to know if there was one thing. Uh, commitment to justice is a lifetime commitment, not a one action commitment. It's my cheeky answer. Um, my one thing is, and like this is a little bit selfish. Um, oh, actually, probably there's a couple. It really depends on who you are and how much power you hold structurally. Um, so if you're a Pakeha person who owns their house, you hold a lot of sway in today's colonial system. Um, and so there's things that you can do with that. Um, I guess for me is that ultimately so much of what we're talking about with Titiriti and those kind of things comes back to things like land back and the relinquishing of power by the crown. And so whatever you can do in that space, we can talk about having more money for te reo Māori, we can talk about having better carvings in our public spaces, but it is, it is about that power rather than the dressings. And so, um, you know, if you own land, how are you gonna return that? Um, if you know that your family inherited a bunch of wealth from a business um, that made its wealth from the lands here, then how, how can you return that? Um, and then how can you embrace te tiriti as something that you need just as much as Māori need as well, and placing that in your heart as a necessity, as a non-negotiable. Um, because you can bet when you put a list of climate demands before the government, they will pick everything else before te tiriti, because that is something that reckons with the heart of the colonial system that we live in, that undermines it and undermines the power that the Crown clutches onto. And so, yeah, that relationship with te tiriti, embracing it, throwing yourself behind it, um, and land back, yeah. Thank you. Um, just before I introduce our next speaker, I just want to welcome um, uh, Harriet and Sarah up there from the ASMS who are our sponsors. They're just sitting to the left of Vicky Noble, who's going to put a hand up and just introduce herself to the crowd. Hello, Vicky. <laughs> okay, so um, thank you very much to the ASMS um, for um, your sponsorship of this meeting. Really grateful to you. You've been great supporters of this for a very long time. Um, okay. Um, our next speaker uh, is Sama Rangamarie Wright, uh, who's one of the organizing committee here for this forum and previous forums. Summer is a co-convenor a convener of Orotayo, the New Zealand Health and Climate Council. She's a PhD candidate at Massey University and a climate health researcher 
in association with Ngā, with Ngā Pai o Te Maramatanga. Trained as a dietitian, uh, she's interested in the relationships between food systems and well-being. She sees food as a key driver for positive transformation of, the, of our ecosystem and of animal and human health. Summer, thank you. Am I able to get my notes displaying on one of these monitors? Thank you. Sorry, it's still, still learning. Um, but it's, yeah, it's really good to be here today. I haven't yet had the experience of speaking to the point that I can completely wing it based on something behind me. So. <laughs> um, but we'll get there. Tēnā koutou, he mihi kia koutou mō tō tautoko te kaupapa o tēnei wiki. Uh, ko puku hoko o te maunga, ko mangapū te awa, ko tainu e te waka, ko Ngāti Mania Poto te iwi, ko Ngāti Kino Haka te hapū, ko Parere te marae, ko Samarangi Mārie Rai tōku ingoa. My name is Summer. Um, as Dave introduced, I've taken a bit of a pathway to come here. Um, and so I'm standing here today in a few capacities, um, but I feel like it was set in motion a long time ago, but briefly um, I became really interested in how animal welfare and how we treat animals and the planet for food relate to our well-being as well as planetary well-being. Um, but anyway, uh, I'm a co-convener of Order Tile, New Zealand Climate and Health Council, along with Dr. Dumok Coffey, who's in Ōtautahi. Um, we've also got our coordinator, Grant, here, and I saw Tess Sneakin, who is one of our uh, executive members. So it's lovely to see you. Um, my day-to-day -day is as a doctoral researcher for Te Rangahotaha Whiaku Mō Ngā Kai o Pōpō at Massey, which is the Future Foods team. And I'm also a researcher under the Ngā Matakitinga Fund for Ngā Pai o Te Māra Matanga which is what I'm going to share with you today. So we're going to think about ka muri ka mua, looking back to move forward in this space. So globally and nationally, despite a major pandemic, despite recessions and climate disasters all across the world and here, governments and commerce are doubling down on their business as usual and this will inevitably collapse under its own weight. But there has been an upsurge in Māori-centred initiatives and environmental taiao action. The reclamation of Mātauranga in the taiao space is signalling a shift in thinking. And the application by Māori can tell us about how we conceptualise climate change, climate health, and how we can act. And so, we wanted to explore 
how Mātauranga Māori contributes to climate health outcomes in Aotearoa. We wanted to understand what climate health and climate change means to Māori and the ways that they are responding to it. So this became our central research question, which was, what contribution does Mātauranga make towards climate health outcomes in Aotearoa? And so to answer this, we had a small bit of funding from the Ngā Matakitinga Fund at Ngā Pai o Te Māra Matanga, and this was also in association with Climate House Aotearoa. The team consisted of Ken Taiapa, who is here today, me, and with support from Helen Moya, Helen Moya Waka Barnes. We also had a Rōpū Tōtoko, Bridget Masters Awatere, Rhys Jones, and Christina McCurcher. And so we talked to nine Māori who were working across a range of spaces and in different capacities as teachers of te reo Māori, as researchers, as hapu iwi and community leaders, and as practitioners on the ground. And these were recruited through ours and their networks. And so we used a interview approach to explore how they understood climate health and how mātauranga informed their practice. We then analysed those to start to answer our research question. Is there much reverb happening or is it okay? Okay, I'm not sure, maybe, okay. Should be okay. Just checking. Um, and so from our analysis of the interviews, um, where participants discuss their experiences, observations and aspirations for te tao through a Māori lens, I wonder if you move your mic just up, up higher up your collar. Let's try that. Yeah, cool. Talking? Is that better? Just. Or is it this one? Maybe this one's not. Oh. Just hang on. We'll get your. Just put your mic to it if that's right. Okay. So I'm not using this one. Just okay. Okay. Back to the other mic. Thank you. Um, yeah, so our participants discussed their experiences, observations, and aspirations for te tao, and how they apply that in their work. And so initially, when we were looking to our data, we got some really direct reflections, but after working with it for a bit, um, we came to reflect a more comprehensive view of what the research and participant voice was. This isn't working now. <laughs> Maybe I'll be clear. Oh, okay. No, there we go. Um, and so our first theme, Kamuri Kamua, was about how we relate to the concept of climate change, where we derive motivations from, and what this might mean for the actions that we take. The second theme. Um, is about the ways that we conceptualise this and how we position ourselves in our work. And the last one is about... Okay. The green one, okay. <laughs> um, and the last theme is about how these understandings translate into action. And so I'm just going to share some highlights and snippets from this. I won't um, share all of it, but... Um, and so the first theme, Kamuri Kamua, is about how Māori concepts and values enable us, enable us to conceptualise changing environments and relationships to place based on our own cultural frameworks. And so climate change is not a Māori term, um, and so to make sense of it, we can refer to whakapapa, examples from tūpuna, and how our obligations derive from these. And so I'm going to give a personal example that speaks a bit to the voice of our participants as well. And a sub-theme that came up in our interviews was about ancestral landscapes and how these inform responsibilities. And so this is a photo of my great-great-grandmother, Mere, holding her children, the older one being Joyce, my great-grandmother. They're in the Waipa River in Otorohanga in the 1920s. And so when I look at this photo, I see Tupuna enjoying their ancestral landscape, one their Tupuna before, before them also had. And so they're 
bathing and playing in what is clearly a clean enough river for babies to swim in. But today, much of Waipa is polluted, it's unsafe for swimming. And so if I look to this image, I can make sense of how we once related to Waipa, um, and it also sets out a vision for how we can relate to it again. And so when it comes to action, I have an obligation to these tūpuna, to the river, and also to our descendants. And so this ancestral landscape is a way of thinking about action. And I think as Indy said, our participants also said that tūpuna were always observant of their environment. And so the ways of seeing and responding to environmental cues and how it's changing can inform the ways that we adapt going forward. And so when I think about the current conference theme, enhancing the Modi, it's about as much restoring physical ancestral landscapes as it is the relationships we have with those places. And a participant said as much, our original landscapes, our original instructions from our tūpuna, and how those in our ways in which the whenua looked prior to us, that being the tuakana, we have an obligation to restore, to reclothe papa tuanuku, restore healthy systems and live in balance with them. Our second theme is then about how we conceptualize and work in this space and how we position ourselves in relation to the work. And so an example of how we do this was talked about by our participants in health co-benefits. And so many of you will be really familiar with this term. Maybe you're even an expert in this space. Um, but health co-benefits are the positive effects on health that come from addressing climate change. These tend to be expressed in quantitative terms, like a mortality reduction in disease or reduced exposure to the amount of particulate matter from transport pollution. And while these measures are true and important, they don't always reflect the totality of the possible health co-benefits of climate action. And so if we think about public transport, um, we know that it's really good. It can create health uh, co-benefits in so many ways by reducing emission, mitigating climate change, increasing active movement, and more equitable participation in our surroundings. But if we relate Matauranga Māori to public transport, we might reveal additional health co-benefits that otherwise we may not have seen. And so this participant said, I think it's probably one way I see mātauranga Māori in active transport is the ability to go places you need to in ways that don't force reliance on one kind of mode, the car. So coming back to mana motuhake, having options, having the ability to access places you need to when you need to. So this means a possible way of conceptualising health co-benefits can include mana motuhake, self-determination, and so now we can understand and advocate for public transport also from a Māori position where we want to see people in our communities able to self-determine how and when they move around in multiple ways that doesn't have to be constrained by polluting cars. And so this means being able to articulate and relate mātauranga to what might be seen as a modern Western issue like transport, but when framed from within te ao Māori, it takes on another meaning. And so another example, another example in health co-benefits is housing. We know that healthy, warm, energy efficient housing creates health benefits for people and for climate. But if we relate housing to te ao Māori, um, let's see what benefits we get. Working on a project with a couple of women up near the East Cape, Te Whanoa Apunui, they had a stream on their land and had been spending a lot of time returning it to a wetland form. And it's interesting because it was all about housing the non-human descendants of Atua. So by this, they mean not just thinking about human health, but also, also about the health of ecosystems and other participants in them who also have whakawhapa to Atua. So climate action through healthy housing that also focuses on housing non-humans in Atua can be even more health-giving we now start to broaden our conception of health co-benefits, where we're also restoring relationships within nature. 
And the last theme is about how these ways of thinking translate into practice. So for one participant, a cornerstone of their work was enhancing the deal of their practitioners, and this enabled them to then better relate to their environment, and by developing these layers of leadership through reo and the matauranga embedded in it, they both reclaim a cultural space and an environmental space and are better equipped to do the restoration. So enhancement of reo and matauranga goes hand in hand with environmental restoration and it's a reclamation of what it means to do environmental action. Another participant talked about how they engaged their hapu and kaitiaki trust for activism. So they identified a kina, kina barren, which happens when you overfish an area and it becomes out of balance. And so they restored this kina barren, which firstly mobilized their kaitiakitanga obligations, but it also contributed to local kai sovereignty because now they could go and get food. This also has positive implications for food sovereignty in a context of rising food costs and just climate disruptions to the food system. They then took this work and lobbied to government. And ultimately, they addressed the problem on their terms. And lastly, restoring for matauranga, rather than purely from Western terms, opens up local knowledge and approaches to restoring relationships that have a healing effect on Papatu Anuku. One participant said, putting the information together, we're trying things out, we're actually out there in the tile trying things that scientists are telling us you can't possibly do. We've been told you cannot restore tohiroa on our coast, for example. Well, bugger that, we're going to have a go. And we've been talking to other Māori communities around the country and they're doing the same. So it's all about doing things on our own terms, reclaiming spaces and places according to responsibilities and aspirations. So ultimately, what we're trying to say is that Māori contributions to climate health outcomes is a decolonizing story of how we transition mātauranga into examples of sustainable practice. And this is about being self-determining in our relationships with te taiao. So going back to our research question, what is the contribution of mātauranga to climate health outcomes in Aotearoa? We heard that action for climate health derives from mātauranga, and it's ultimately about how we relate to each other, to the environment, and about reclaiming and instituting those understandings. But it's not easy. Um, I hope I didn't make it sound really straightforward. <laughs> um, participants described so many challenges in their various work. And as Indy said, climate change is so complex with such a long history embedded in dominant power structures. At every turn, there are vested interests um, who are that power structure. And so in order for mātauranga to fully support climate health in Aotearoa, there needs to be a kind of paradigmatic power shift that allows its full resourcing and application in various spaces and places. And this will enable the healing potentials of indigenous relationships to place. And this research is also about us claiming some space and conversations about climate health and climate change and reclaiming a voice for Māori determined action. And the ways that we do this um, and that our participants also talked about it can strengthen conventional science if it's co-led with Māori. So doing this, it contributes to the Ngā Matakitenga Rangaho. It's building a pātaka for climate health Aotearoa. And also under my order tile hat, I think this will help us as an organisation to better conceptualise climate change and climate health and advocate for it. And just a side note, I couldn't not, if you're a health professional or health organisation, I would urge you to join us. Um, it's a way of finding community and building networks um, and fostering relationships that we can then coalesce for climate change. And so you can talk to me about that at any time. Here's my contact. And very, very lastly, um, I think this is going to be the only opportunity, apart from Dave making us stand up before, I just want to mihi to our conference organisers, Jim, Ken, Victoria, Debbie, Emma, Nolene, Stephanie, Helen, David, 
and me, as well as Anne, who is not pictured. I couldn't get a photo in time. Um, but it's a big effort, and we really, really hope that you enjoy it. Yeah, so any, any partai? Don't go away. Um, kia ora, Summer. That's fabulous. There's, um, there's an enormous amount to learn here. Um, and, you know, is this all new or is this really about uh, rediscovering things that we have chosen to forget, perhaps? You know, um, some of the enduring truths that um, we choose to turn away from. There's some questions on Slido that I want to go to, um, Summer, if that's okay. Um, and there's a couple of questions that are sort of very similar. You know, that obviously from Pākehā uh, members of the audience who see the value of, uh, of what you've been speaking to and also of what India was speaking to earlier and want to know what is the best way that they can do with, from their, in, their, in their way to support your aspirations or these aspirations. Yeah, I think a lot of this work is by Māori, for Māori, um, and so that's a space that you know we are determining. If you are in charge of resourcing, um, <laughs> just give it. <laughs> um, but one thing that a participant said was that offered Mātauranga restoration isn't funded, but has to be specific um, physical environmental objectives. So that's something to think about. Um, and as I said right at the end, if there's opportunity to co-lead with Māori, um, under a tititi or mātiki mai relationship, that's a way to start thinking about how you, how you can do that. Okay, cool. Thank you, Summer. Um, just while uh, I go through a few more questions, could we flick up um, uh, Summer's slide around theme one? Um, it was, someone is very keen to photograph it, so if we could just get that up. You know, I've already had the chance to do that, so <laughs> I thought it was pretty good. Um, okay. Uh, Here's a question for you, it's a popular one. Uh, kia ora, uh, what, are the, what are some of the key uh, matauranga initiatives we should be including in the design of our new healthcare facilities? Interesting, I don't know if I could answer that off the bat, um, but hmm. I'll have to think about that one. Maybe that's something that we could talk about at um, morning tea, and there'll be people in the room that'll have a view on that, I'm sure. Um, another one, I think this might be, uh, or we'll see how we go. Um, uh, Namihi Nui Summer, is it possible to identify a set of specific kawanatanga barriers that Tau Iwi allies can work on? One thing that participants said was the undervaluing or devaluing of mātauranga. Um, so I think engaging respectfully there um, is one way to get around that. And maybe that's really, really obvious. Um, but yeah, that's a major one. Okay, I, I'm just gonna, we're going to go to morning tea very shortly. I just want to come back to that very first question that related to how Pākehā can uh, assist in this journey, and I want you to say it again, because you gave a fabulous answer about help you be, if you've got the resources, come on. It's not about, you know, this is, non, uh, this is actually about, I, I, I'm, what I'm saying here is that, what you're saying here, I think, is that our role is to support you to do what you need to do for yourselves which will benefit all of us. Would that be a, a good summary of that? Yeah. Okay, all right, okay. Well, I think that's quite a good note to end this morning's session on. Um, it's been a fa fantastic session. I really want to thank our two speakers. Um, India, Summer, thank you very much for both of you and for the questions of the audience and for the people in the hubs. I, I hope you found it um, really interesting. Um, morning tea is going to be outside. There'll be a cutter here before we tuck in, please. Um, and uh, it'll, uh, if we could be back here at 11 o'clock on the dot, it'd be really great. And uh, look forward to seeing you soon. So thank you very much.
good. Okay, so we might just go back and um, I'll pick on friends because I don't think it's fair to pick on people that I don't know. So I'm going to walk up to my good friend Vicky Noble and ask her why she's here today and what she hopes to get out of this forum. And um, she can introduce herself a little bit because she's got some history here. What it is to be a good friend of you, David. <laughs> Uh, kia ora tato. Um, I'm Vicky Noble. I'm a registered nurse by background. Um, a long-standing history in um, healthcare, uh, both in DHBs and primary care, and over the last six years uh, with the Department of Corrections. So why am I here? Um, here because climate and its impact on all aspects of health is incredibly important and we don't really have the language in healthcare to talk about it and to have conversations. It's not something that we do a lot. Um, so I'm here to hear the conversations and to learn the language. And thank you very much. Thank you, Vicky. Thank you. I'm going to go across to Tony Moyes. Um, Tony can introduce herself, but um, she's the chair of the Fisher and Paykel Healthcare Foundation. Um, and one of the key sponsors of this meeting, so Tony. Kia ora David, kia ora koutou. Yes, um, my name is Tony Moyes. Um, I'm originally from Tauranga Moana, live here in Wellington now. Um, very, very honoured to be part of the Fisher and Paykel Healthcare Foundation. Our purpose is to support healthier communities uh, and we have a particular focus on South Auckland, um, the area where the company itself is based. Um, and we're really trying to work um, in the domains of environment, health and education and we um, are seeing the overlaps between these things and we want, I'm really here to educate myself. Um, I am not from a um, healthcare background. I have done some work in the climate change um, domain, however, and I'm just really grateful to be able to have the opportunity to listen to so many um, wise people today and think about what we can do to um, empower some of these initiatives. So, kia ora. Thanks, Tony. Um, I'm just going to go up to one of our um, other sponsors, um, the ASMS crowd. And I'm gonna, I know Sarah's given me the evil eye there, but. Um, I'm going, to, I'm going to pass this along and just um, thank Sarah and Harriet, who's a policy director there at ASMS, for their support for this meeting. And just as why do they support us? Kia ora koutou, ko Harriet Wild toko ingoa. Um, why do we support this mahi? Because the future of our healthcare system and our workforce and the communities and people that um, that are supported by um, our hospitals, our practitioners will be responding to um, a changed climate. So we need to understand how to make um, things safer, more responsive, and informed by Mātauranga Māori, Te Ao Māori, to uphold te tiriti and create a just transition for all. Kia ora. Kia Harriet. Um, where's, is Rob Burrell still here? Where's Rob? He's hiding. I can't see him. I, say it again. Is he here? No. No, he's outside. Okay. Maybe I'll ask um, one of the committee um, to talk a little bit about um, <clears throat> where we've come to in the... This is the fifth forum, and there's quite a lot of progress has been made. Rob actually at the morning tea talked about, um, the, we're about to start, I'll just finish this though, T talked about this mahi when it started, you know, and it was, um, it was a fight at the fringes. You know, that's where we were. We were fighting at the fringes. Now it's just a fight because we're not at the fringes, but we're in the middle of it. So that's quite an interesting observation that he made. Okay, I think we're going to move on now. So uh, I'll put this away. Okay, can people hear me? Can you hold your hand up, nod your head, something like that? Kia ora, brother. wonders of technology, eh? To be blunt, I caused it. <laughs> 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 Kia ora, David. Um, 
um, I can see a few people in front of me. We've got 10 here and I can see about three people online and I see lots of names. Uh, my name's Ihi Heke. I'm from Waikato Tainui. Um, I live down the road a little bit from here, but officially we're still in the Tainui district when we're in South Auckland. Um, nice to see a few faces coming on so I can see who's here uh, and the faces that are in the room today. Um, I'm here with uh, Gabby Waino from Gizzi as well. Everybody say kia ora, Gabby. She's uh, doing a bit of an intern trip with us to um, have a look at Tayo and, and to understand some of the connections between what we do and environment. Recording in progress. Well, we've just been told and we're getting a bit of echo in here now. So, so uh it was Jim Cotter that coordinated me to come and speak to you. And then he uh emailed me yesterday yesterday and said, I'm actually in France. And I said, the next time I catch you, Jim Cotter, I'm gonna stick my foot right up your backside. Convincing me to come and then not turning up yourself. So uh I'll have a word with Jim about that. Uh <laughs> I'm pleased to be here to have a talk with the people that are here today, though, uh, and those that are interested in some of the ways of knowing environment from a Māori perspective. Um, I'll give you some brief introductions to some of the things that have been happening in the sector for the work that we do in well-being and health and the connection to environment as well. Does that sound okay? I think we're at about 10 past 11, so we've got 20 minutes to have a chat with you. Um, it's been a busy week. Uh, yesterday we presented at PENS, which is Physical Education New Zealand. Um, after we finish this, we're down to Tūrangi to present at the Hillary Outdoors Pursuit Centre for two days. And then on Friday night, we're off to Systems Dynamics Conference in Chicago. Um, so for my sins, I guess, I'm being punished by me to do a lot of um, conferences. Um, but uh, we'll get through some information as quickly as we can while we're here. Uh, I came through Otago University through the PE school. Um, more recently, uh, I've been working as an honorary research fellow for um, Auckland University in biostats and epidemiology. Um, that's with uh, Boyd Swinburne um, and a number of other people over there that convinced me to come and do some work with the university. Um, in large part, my work is around uh, Indigenous health and what methods we use to connect to that. Uh, must be close to 15 years ago, I wrote a Māori health framework called Atua Matua. Um, that Atua Matua framework um, has been in circulation in a number of locations more recently. Uh, the Healthy Active Learning Initiative that the government funded uh, maybe three years ago now, um, that came towards us as well. And through Mātaiao and Papu Waikura, which is co-headed by uh, Wayne Ngata. Uh, we're working in 70 Māori schools on wellbeing using the Atua Matua approach to do that. In essence, Atua Matua has uh, five levels to it uh, for an entry point. For us, there's 24. Uh, 12 of those come under environmental information and the other 12 come under the practice of information that we learn from environment to improve our wellbeing. Um, sounds complicated at this point, but when we drop it down into the five levels, um, what we do is identify a specific environmental space. And for Māori, there are three. Um, we either connect to stars, water, or land. And all of our information around environment will come through one of those three uh, pathways. From there, um, we show a district-centred version of that, which is usually around a 50k radius. Uh, from that, we get a contextual relevance for the information. 
which means that their recruitment agent is Mātauranga Māori and not health. And Mātauranga Māori is directly connected to environment. And so their bodies and uh, uh, packages, if you like, of environmental knowledge that are specific to a, an area. So that second area is uh, a honongo or a whakapai, a whakapapa or tātai to um, understanding what happens in a region or in a district. And that's our second zone. Our third space is that we actively teach what we want people to know from a district in terms of how that district provides opportunities to improve their well-being, which might mean if they're, for example, coastal, um, we teach them the impact of um, tidal changes and how if we're suggesting there's an opportunity for intervention and well-being that we structure that around uh, tidal changes. So if it's new information, we coordinate that for an incoming tide to deliver the ideas. If we're doing evaluation and assessment, we coordinate that to happen when we've got an outgoing tide. So it's environmentally centered and it's in the context of the space we're in. And we teach them something from the environment that will be able to provide a metaphor for learning for that group. So that's our third space. So we start with environment, we show connection, then we look at the metaphor for learning. The fourth space is the space where we look at our physical activity and nutrition. And this is a, a number of opportunities depending on which modality you want to choose. Um, and in the past, this has been restricted and predominantly by government saying that we could only use wakama, modako, um, kapahaka, and more recently takarotaka to, to achieve that. So, so those were the four modalities that we use for physical activity for Maori, which is a load of crap. Uh, we can use anything we want. Uh, we can deliver it through any modality we choose. It just depends what aspect of that we want to connect to. So for example, uh, we sometimes use uh, mountain bikes. People have said to me, I don't know how you can use a mountain bike. You didn't have them. You said, the mountain bike is a modality for the delivery of mountain-based information. And when I start to ride uphill, uh, I think called moaning a cord, it all happens, where the mountain has a conversation with me, and if I'm not fit enough, it gets loud in your ears really quickly. <laughs> uh, but if you've been a few times and you have enough cardio fit or fitness about you, you can look around and see things. Um, that's moaning a cord. So the mountain bike doesn't matter. The mountain does but that's just the medium. So that's why we're shifting into a whole range of different spaces to achieve it. So that's our fourth area. So another review environment, then into a connection to a district. The third is the metaphor that we learn from. The fourth is the modality. The final space is the timing for when we're going to deliver something. Our marama has had a big jump in interest uh, nationally and globally with other indigenous people looking to what Maori are doing for leadership in the space of understanding moon phases. Now, marama means moon, and taka means things associated with the moon. Now, what a lot of people don't know is that there's uh, three other measurements of time that are on either side of it. So, Tiro Hunga Fetu is um, a viewing of constellations to see what's happening, and we take annual readings from that. Rangi Ma Tamu, who's come into the space again, uh, is leading the way here. So, he's um, providing a lot of information about Matariki, and every star you can imagine he's um, reporting on. So if you want more about that, um, then he's your go-to for sure. Um, the next phase down from that is kaupekatanga, which is understanding seasonal change and what that causes in um, different locations. Uh, we've been studying this quite a bit to understand that the phases we use at the moment um, have been based around um, the Gregorian time system. Um, which was an outcome of um, Pope Gregory's papal bull that said everybody needs to follow time this way. We didn't get the memo. So we follow our own. Tried following yours, didn't work, going back to ours again. In essence, what this means is that environment decides when it's time to change, not people. So September 1 doesn't mean anything to us. And I suspect it doesn't mean anything to a tree either. But when we're told it's spring, tree doesn't know. So we're shifting back to uh, Maori ways of identifying seasonal change. And in some areas, um, there's sometimes seven, sometimes eight within the traditional way of seeing summer, for example. So in the northern area, it's not unheard of to hear of uh, matati versions of seasons, and there's eight. 
and they have different indicators to tell you what phase of summer you're in. But I suspect the same things are happening in other districts um, nationally, and I know of a number of different uh, versions of winter in the South Island and around Tuwharetō from uh, Taupo where they recognise different phases. So those are apparent as well. You'll see more of this arriving back into circulation over the next um, 18 months, I would say. Then we move into Maramataka, which is a study of the moon, to see what tidal effect that causes. And we're seeing uh, opportunities for humans to match what animals and plants already do. And that you'll see different levels of productivity from your garden and from the ocean at certain times of um, the month. For three or four days at a time, there'll be massive outputs and then it'll change and move across that month. So much so that um, I suspect uh, as we embrace more of this concept, um, we'll be able to achieve higher levels of personal best sporting achievements if they learn to us align those with uh, full moon and leading up to a full tide where people, animals and plants produce their biggest outputs. So that's still yet to come, but we're working in that space of what a high performance training system looks like that's environmentally centered. So that's the third phase of coming through from uh, a year long, a uh, seasonal, a month. And the most recent is what we've been calling tohu taka, which is reading three and four day indicators of change. Um, they are obtained from looking at current weather patterns, understanding uh, the movements of birds, trees, insects, and fish. And we teach these into kura as a replacement for safety action plans or for risk assessment models and a whole range of pre-existing um, models we're moving out and heading back to tohu taka that allows our kids to read all five areas of um, weather, birds, trees, insects, and fish, um, which we prefer. Uh, because it removes the risk component from it. And this is the pursuit of knowledge. And it's uh, more encouraging for schools, teachers, and um, kids to go out without feeling as though they have to overcome the demands of validating why they're living. Uh, so that's been a challenge to us to move around to get access to well-being that's environmentally centered by getting rid of as many barriers as we can. So uh, another quick review. We started with a knowledge base that's environmentally centered. We gave it a context for why we would do it that was around a district. We then moved into uh, providing a metaphor to learn from. Uh, then we shifted into a modality for the delivery of it. And then the timing was the last phase. Now, what I'll do in the last um, little while is give you some examples of how we've been doing this. Um, there's one that's really easy to access from where I'm standing here, um, although um, less so when you can't see outside. But... If you were able to see directly behind me, you'd notice the uh, Rangitoto and looking at the volcano up here in Auckland. Um, if we were to look at the environment that it's connected to, um, it's land-based, um, but we also have the effects of understanding when uh, it erupts, what it's going to do to the surrounding environments. But essentially, it's land-based. Um, if we look at the whakapapa of the Atua that uh, produces that, that's Mataho, and Mataho is responsible for volcanoes. Um, there's 51 of them, I think, in the Auckland district alone just here. So um, a lot of influence from Mataho. Uh, Mataho has uh, one of his well-known daughters, which isn't surprising, is Mahuika. Um, she's goddess of fire and an equivalent to Pele from Hawaii. Um, she's married to um, the fella that you see on bus stop signs all over the place, which is um, Owahi Kore. And Owahi... Um, Owehi Tudor specifically is the Atua of smoke. And so when you see all those Owehi Kore signs that say don't smoke, that's who they're talking about. I don't even know if fellas even know that. But the Atua of smoke is Owehi um, um, Tudor. Owehi Tudor is also the Atua of um, meteors, and particularly the um, tail that you see on the back of meteors uh, in comets. Um, there's three other sisters that are associated with this from a whakapapa perspective, which is uh, Miru, Rohe, and Hininui Te Pō. Um, all three of those sisters come to visit Mahuika fairly regularly, um, but what's not well known is that all three of them are sisters of death. Um, they're associated with the underworld. Um, why I'm telling you this is that when we recently discussed this, this was an approach to smoking cessation, um, that... First off, we had to indicate to the Māori community which environment we were connecting to, which was land-based. 
we had to show a context of who it is we're dealing with, which is through that whakapapa, which I just gave you. Then we move into what's the metaphor for learning. Well, from a Māori perspective, uh, when there's three sisters of death that come to visit Mahuika, who's fire, but smoke is associated with it, it makes smoking highly risky. Three times the risk of death if you smoke cigarettes. And none of this has anything to do with health, but everything to do with the environment causes it. And from a Māori perspective, we're looking at the whakapapa rationale for why smoking is dangerous that removes the health aspect of it from it, which means that uh, Māori will make changes because the rationale for why isn't centred around people, it's centred around environments that cause it. So, uh, in essence, it's a way of looking at a number of different effects that we um, currently engage with as Māori and reconstituting those into environmentally centred reasons for why we would change and not for people-centred reasons for why we would change. Um, this is important because it uh, removes the deficit aspect that's usually applied to Māori communities about what they're experiencing, CBDs or, or diabetes or smoking cessation. It also allows Māori to be self-defined in that uh, we don't have a perceived expert turn up and tell us what we're doing badly and that we were lucky we were saved by them. And lastly, it allows us to move into the space of the pursuit of knowledge instead of the pursuit of well-being. And all of our knowledge is environmentally centred which means that we get an opportunity to relearn the things that were cut off from us in 1907 through the Tohunga Suppression Act. Uh, so this has been my space of working for the last 15 years. I'm out of interest. Mason Jury marked my um, PhD, and this was an opportunity to pay that back by looking at ways to uh, formulate different ways of knowing the environment that can contribute to humans, but only as an incidental outcome of understanding what they can do. Uh, this was more than 20 years ago that I wrote that thing. And uh, at the time, it didn't make sense to me to write a PhD on health and well-being by sitting inside for five years looking at a computer. Um, but now that I'm out the other side and have opportunity to talk to you fellas about it, maybe it's a difficult uh, format. I'm um, looking at a computer, looking at other fellas. Um, I haven't done any of the slide changes, but you can get access to those and have a read through them if you want. Not that any of it will make sense to you. It's all written in Māori, but have a shot and see where you get to. Uh, we've got three minutes left. I don't know if you want a question or you want me to continue with another example or what you want, but um, I think it wraps at 11.30. Is that correct? Yeah, Ihirangi. It's um, David Gala here. I'm the um, MC oh, Jim, today. next time Kia I see you, watch out, you little bugger. Yeah, absolutely. Um, for others that were here, I'm uh, humbled that you'd turn up. Um, the people here were gracious enough to connect me up, even though I'm difficult to work with. I'm a technician's nightmare and an organiser's nightmare at an even worse level. Often I'll sit in the car and wait until they come out into the car park looking for me before I come in the building. <laughs> so at least I turned up 10 minutes early today. Kia ora, um, thank you for doing that. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, if I happen to see you or you bump into me in the street, I won't know who you are, so you'll have to introduce yourselves, and I'm happy to talk to more of you in the future. Um, we leave here, head to the Outdoors Pursuit Centre, and then we're up into the snow for two days to talk to the instructors about other ways of knowing the environment and how they contribute to the well-being of people. Um, there have been questions very quickly in the past where people have said that it seems as though you've got to be fit to get access to what you do, um, which isn't entirely true. Uh, sometimes we work on what the intellectual or psychological opportunities are for change as much as we do in the spiritual space of creating connections to a location. Uh, so um, often. I've had people wonder why Māori will stand and say tēnā hōtou, tēnā hōtou, tēnā hōtou three times because they're addressing all three parts of you that sit in front of us, which means we address your physical, your psychological and your spiritual beings, which means that if we were only to look at the physical opportunities for causing change and well-being as a reflection of the environment, and if we got that 100% right, we would only ever be 33% at best of success. So we have to look at all three ways of encapsulating that in any environmental initiative that we engage with. Bye-bye. Kia ora, we've got a question. Ah, yes. Um, kia ora, have you seen positive outcomes within communities with implementing the Te Aho Atua Matua framework? Or yes, uh, absolutely. 
Um, there's a couple of ironies in this space in that some of the kura we're working with are pushing back on it um, because they don't want to head outside. And some of it's because of the institutionalized uh, locations where they've learned to teach. And that's been a difficult one for us to swallow because we thought there would have been a lot of interest in heading back into the environment and to teach from you again. So uh, that may change and it may mean we need to go up the system to affect change at a, a, a teacher's college level. Um, certainly with a number of the international colleagues that we work on, with on this space, there's been a massive level of interest. Um, I didn't mention it at the start, I don't think, but um, I contracted Google, which is the devil. Um, and I happen to bed with the devil every now and then and have a talk with them about um, indigenous data. Um, and they're very interested in what Atua Matua conveys as, as an idea that environmental sustainability is the key to causing uh, changes in well-being. Um, they also want to know what our uh, uh, contributions might be to unconscious bias in the development of AI over the next 10 years. And I think they were a bit pissy when I said, I don't know if there's such a thing as unconscious bias. There's just bias. Uh, so we're working in that space to see what it's going to do. Uh, we're back there again on Friday. Um, but uh, not surprisingly, there's a, a more of an in international appetite for things like Atua Matua because of its environmental context than there is here. But we continue on. And to be blunt, um, don't care whether people like it or not, uh, we do. I've got a um, couple more questions. Um, how do we learn more about Atua Matua? Um, well, we've just started to set up a website. Um, again, it's been pretty funny because I never wrote this document to share it with anyone wrote it 15 years ago just for my own work. People have been getting a hold of it and using it in different places. Uh, so um, in the next, actually the website's live now. I think it's atuamatua.co.nz. There's a few things floating around on there. We'll start loading more information into there. Um, occasionally we'll run workshops for groups if they're not painful. Um, sometimes we'll take them up into environments. Um, I've been running maybe half a dozen wananga a year where they're all environmentally centered. Uh, those are high alpine opportunities. Um, in August, we take a group on skins where they have to walk up to the top of the hill. We put them in huts and they stay there for a few nights. We do wakaama wananga where we take them paddling for three or four days and uh, on outrigger canoes. Uh, we run another one that's a mountain bike that's about forest. Um, and occasionally we'll do um, diving, hunting, fishing ones where we'll teach them about uh, ocean changes and uh, especially um, the shifts in the temperature of the sea. So um, if there's interest in people apply or message us or send stuff to us, then we look at it and consider it and see how we go. Um, is this approach mirrored in other indigenous nations? Uh, yes and no. Uh, one of this, there's not how we do that's unusual compared to other indigenous nations is um, we have Mātoranga Māori, um, which most indigenous nations have the equivalent to. There's been a number of questions from some of my colleagues about whether Mātoranga is a real thing, and that what we tend to have is environmentally centred bodies of knowledge, and that Mātoranga is a term that's been developed to encapsulate all Māori, and we don't act the same. So for the time being, it might be a term that's useful, but probably never existed. It's something that's um, uh, a blanket approach to knowing things, and we don't work that way. We're um, the products of specific environments where we sit. Um, the second phase of uh, Mātaranga Māori depends on the district you're from, but for us, it's uh, mōhiotanga, which is how you build capacity in your workforce or whomever to get better at the things they want to do. Where Māori are different from other Indigenous nations globally is the third phase, uh, which is Māramatanga, which is developing dynamic capability, which is where we take information from the environment and apply it into spaces it was never intended for. Now, um, with all humility, what happens globally when we work with other indigenous nations is often they believe they're 30 years behind us because of that last phase of dynamic capability, which is the systems approach to using the environment to teach us a whole range of things around career, education, health, any aspect we want to apply it to. And there's an opportunity for innovation and creativity in that space that we grasp and move with that others don't. However, as Māori, when we look back on our situation, we don't believe we're doing well at all. And certainly the statistics don't support that we're doing better than anyone else. 
But in terms of um, being confrontational to our government and pushing the boundaries, absolutely. Um, and that's part of our nature is to push into spaces where others won't go. So, yes. And we've got one last question and then we're going to try and zoom back in so we can hear David. Yes. Thank you. Um, are you linked in with other educational bodies such as Enviro schools within Aotearoa? I uh, have been in the past. Um, I've had talks with Enviro schools. I've run the odd wānanga for them. Um, we tend to run in parallel more often than not. Uh, the group that I work through most is Tapu Waikura in Mātaiao. Tapu Waikura has a uh, website. They're funded by um, Sport New Zealand and especially under the Healthy Active Learning Initiative. Enviro schools um, is working from that education perspective of, I think, um, engaging with things Māori simultaneously with things environment. Um, whereas what we're trying to um, promote is Mātauranga Māori for the sake of Mātauranga Māori and not for well-being. And that those are incidental. Um, and so what you see presented in people, people can choose to engage with or not. So we don't go after those, which means that we're not student-centred. We're not people-centred, we're not patient-centred. We're environment-centred and will remain so. Mutu, dena tato. Okay, come <laughs> it was wonderful. I'm sorry we, that we haven't been able to see your slide. Wow, that was pretty amazing. Um, I was trying to ask him questions, but I broke the cardinal rule of not using Slido. <laughs> Tried to think I could do it from here, which I couldn't, but I asked some questions. Um, we're going to try and find a little bit more information around how you might access a bit more knowledge about that program, Matua Matua. You know, Johnny might be able to help us. I don't know whether Johnny yes. is connected with Ihi, um, and maybe you could help us with that. Because, you know, for me, you know, that's, that was quite a fascinating talk. Unbelievable. You know, just to get a set, you get a sort of glimpses of the depth of this, you know, how deep this thing runs, you know, uh, and what the potential of it actually is. You know, uh, but I think that it's just a sort of a snippet we've just had a look at, you know, and wow, wouldn't it be good to just learn a little bit more? And that's what this conference is about. So we'll try and find some access to how, you, how we can actually sort of delve into this in a, in a little bit more depth. But I think now we're going to move on to our first panel of the um, conference. And this panel is addressing the issue, uh, again, of strategy, enhancing the Māori uh, strategy. And we have... Um, four speakers, quite different speakers here. I'm going to ask them to, uh, they're all going to speak for about five minutes each and then we're going to um, have a bit of a group discussion and some questions that we're going to delve in here, uh, particularly around the issue of strategy. All of them do very different things, but they're all kind of interrelated. Um, uh, the first speaker um, will be um, Kimberly Humphrey. Um, she's, I think, in California today. I'm not sure. She's moving from Harvard to the East Coast to the West Coast, um, and I'll let Kimberly introduce herself later, but she's an Australian, she's an emergency department doctor um, uh, who has developed a deep, deep interest in equity, uh, uh, personal health and environmental health, and is a researcher in that area, and, uh, and so we'll look forward to hearing from her. Our second uh, speaker will be Peter Van Gerwen, who's a nurse actually working in Christchurch. Um, and um, he's on a bit of a journey here of discovery in his nursing practice around the, the connections between um, personal health and environmental, well, environmental health. Our third presentation will be from uh, a couple, um, Hannah Moyer uh, and um, Anna Thorpe, uh, who are both uh, working for the big uh, Christchurch uh, PHO Pegasus. Um, and I think they'll talk to us a, a little bit about their own journey. And I think Pegasus is probably, the, in fact, from my conversations with them, the only primary care organisation in the country that actually has taken on this kopapa, you know, which is kind of interesting, really, when you think about it, when you think about where the bulk of health and well-being is created. Uh, you know, it's not necessarily in the health space, I have to say, of course. We all know that, and we're hearing more and more about that today, aren't we? That it's not actually in the health space. Health picks up the consequences of those uh, issues that we're not dealing with. But it'll be very interesting to hear their story. And our final uh, panellist this morning is Rick Lomax, who's 
actually here, Hannah and uh, Anna are in Christchurch and Peter's in Christchurch at the Christchurch Hub, Kimberley's in California or somewhere in between, and uh, Rick Lomax, who's normally in Auckland, is here. So it's, we're, we're you know, a, a big group. Um, Rick, is a, he'll introduce himself too, but uh, he's a, a technical expert and sustainability man with Becker. Uh, he worked for the iconic um, uh, sustainable development unit in the British NHS before coming to New Zealand. And he's got some very interesting work um, with some of the local councils around sustainability and developing a framework um, that may be applicable to a much broader, um, to, a, to, to this kaupapa actually, much broader kaupapa than just you know, into the health and well-being space. Um, but I think that if we're ready to go, uh, there's Kimberly on the screen, wow. Um, welcome Kimberly, where are you today? I'm in California. I are you in California? California, yes. Yeah, you, you made it. Well, I'm going to get out of your way, and if you wouldn't mind just giving yourself a brief introduction. You've got about five minutes um, to, to run through your, your shtick, and uh, we'll come back for questions. But thank you very much for making the time. I know what a hectic week you've had, so I'm really grateful to you. We all are. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, yes, so I am in California. I give you a bit of background around uh, my activities and what I've been doing. So I am an emergency physician by training. I've been a consultant emergency physician for quite a few years now, mainly working in Adelaide, but I've worked um, throughout Australia. Over the last few years, I've really shifted my focus to climate change and health, which has a very, there is a very profound impact from climate change on emergency medicine and a strong interlinkage between emergency medicine, climate change and public health, which is something that's not always grasped or appreciated, I think, even amongst my colleagues in the medical community. Uh, for the last year, from July last year until now, I've been at Harvard as a climate change and human health fellow. And I'm actually on my way back to Australia to begin working for the South Australian government on climate and health policy. And we're looking at really integrating um, adaptation and mitigation very strongly into our health systems to build a, a climate resilient um, health system, essentially. As David outlined, my specific research interests are very strongly in climate resilient health systems. That's not just infrastructure, it's all the way from public health and what we do at the outset through to how we protect our hospitals and the people within them, but also equity, public health, environmental justice, and how we treat our communities and how all of that intersects to create what our picture of health looks like. What I'm going to be talking about today is what we need to do for our medical students, our medical trainees, our future doctors across the world really. So um, my specific interest as I've outlined is emergency medicine. Our college, as some of you might know, is the Australasian College, which also encompasses New Zealand as well. So I've, I have worked uh, quite closely within both of those areas. But really, I see what I'm about to talk about as something that we need to adapt to our global audience. So medical schools and postgraduate curriculum across the world. And we'll discuss some of the um, issues that we have with doing that. So let me see if I can get my slide, there we go. Um, so the first thing I want to mention is medical school teaching is traditionally biomedical and it still is. So when I went to medical school, which was a little while ago now, but not terribly long, it's very much centered around disease processes and how we treat them historically even more so and even now where we are adapting how we do teach our medical students into more of a holistic sense it is still really the core of all medical teaching is disease processes and bio, uh, biomedical models and that's still really the structure of what we do why is this a problem so 80 percent of medical education is focused on biology and 60 percent of premature deaths for example are related to social environmental factors so we still don't really teach our students very well that the social determinants of health and environmental medicine really does contribute so very strongly to how well people are and there's a real focus on illness and not health and we really need to reframe everything we're doing to move away from this how do we integrate climate and health education? Now, there has been an accelerating movement globally to start bringing climate change concepts into medical education. Unfortunately, what has predominantly been the way this is done is there will be either standalone tutorials or maybe at the better schools that are doing this, they might integrate climate change into a particular organ system. So you talk about lungs and you talk about climate change and the effects of pollution and global warming on lungs like you would with smoking. 
What we're really missing is integrating those climate change concepts with planetary health, with sustainability, with everything else that really goes into wellness and combining it all as one unit that is just the foundation and the underpinning of everything we do. So if we look at this model here, to begin with, we have genetics and individual behaviours, and that's under this sort of the individual determinants of health. And this is the level that's most addressed by our traditional biomedical education models. What we need to do is bring in these other things, so social determinants of health and existing inequities, and what climate change does to exacerbate these inequities, and the co-benefits solutions that address both the inequities and adaptation to climate change. So for example, social capacity building, we know people that have a very strong social network do better in heat waves. So that is a strong part of this as well. And then bringing in the environment, so the intersection between the environment and health and the impact of urban planning on health outcomes. And once again, the co-benefits of solutions that address both underlying inequities and climate change. So the thing I want to just emphasize before I move on to one of my penultimate slides is that the idea of this, because it is a global framework, is to adapt it to each, each culture, each local context, and understand that it can work symbiotically with the beliefs of certain um, of societies and communities. And this shouldn't be at odds with them. It should be a tool to incorporate into the concept of wellness in a really, really holistic way. So the framework for integrating climate change concepts into the health curriculum um, that we're pioneering is firstly, planetary health concepts. So the intersection between earth and people, the one health concept, the intersection between people and animals and the earth as a whole. Environmental justice and social determinants of health. So that interaction with existing health disparities, both the impacts and solutions, and particularly the social determinants of health. And bringing into this cultural understanding and the local context of the community to create those really strong frameworks locally. There of course needs to be the, the teaching of the biology and how the climate interacts with organ systems how public and preventative health care can strengthen communities um, to both decrease carbon emissions through decreased hospitalizations, but also to really create communities of healthy people that can better withstand the impacts of climate change as well. Sustainable low carbon health systems themselves, so high, high carbon, low value care, and really thinking about greening hospitals and, and everything we do should be contributing to good care of people and reducing carbon emissions as far as we can. And then the role of medical students and doctors as advocates and uh, as those who develop policy as well. So these are really the six key pillars that we should be teaching all of our medical students, everybody who's going through medical school to enable them to be able to manage and treat patients going forward who are affected by climate change. And I'll just skip over this last one. And that is me almost done. The only thing I want to leave on is that climate change is the biggest global health threat that we have across the world in all communities, but particularly in those who already have existing inequities and disparities as well. And we need to really think about addressing climate change in a way that addresses all of those inequities and creates fair and just communities. Thank you very much. Kiora, thank you, Kimberly. Um, uh, please stand by. Um, now, our next speaker is um, Peter uh, from the Christchurch Hub. Um, how are we doing up there? Hopefully not too far away. Very good. Are you with us, Peter? I think so. Can you hear us? Yeah, great. Yeah, fantastic. I'll step out of the way. Okay. All right. Uh, well, um, Kia ora koutou. Um, so I'm Peter, and um, I'm really excited to have this opportunity to present to this group um, today, um, share a little bit uh, about myself, and um, but most of all to, to learn from you all and um, to consider where all this um, information and experience that we're sharing this morning um, fits into the focus of um, strategy or um, enhancing the, the Māori. Um, so I'm a community nurse um, based in Otatahi Christchurch. Um, so I'll be talking a bit from that perspective. Um, I'm quite new to this area of expertise, so possibly this presentation will embody a bit of a, a state of um, Mori Oho. 
um, where I'm just uh, starting to be quite interested and um, wanting to learn how I can sort of um, apply some of the, the things that I've learned to, to, to practice. Um, so being here today, I think, is a, a great opportunity for that. Um, so my focus today is acknowledging climate change as a, a determinant of health and uh, what that means for primary health care and um, nursing in Aotearoa. Um, it's perhaps helpful for us just to consider what um, health determinants are in general, which um, I could uh, suggest that they're sort of the intersection and interrelation of um, a large variety of economic, political, cultural, environmental and social factors, which um, can shape health in either um, a positive or a negative way. Um, it's, I think it's important to acknowledge that these um, factors are very influential in um, determining health outcomes, and they, they're more, a lot more significant than just um, individual health behaviours or even access to, to health care um, systems and, and clinical care in itself. So um, we shouldn't ignore these things. Um, but in, in primary health care, the use of um, sort of thinking of health determinants and, and using a framework to screen for susceptibility um, and the influence and exposure to conditions which have implications to, to health, um, I think is a very useful process to kind of acknowledge the diversity of individuals, families and, and communities that we provide primary care for and how that um, having that information can be um, used, uh, used to sort of um, give a, a appropriate care that sort of moves a, a bit beyond a one size fits all approach to, to one that um, supports health equity. Um, and of course, health equity is quite closely related to the issue of, of climate justice, which is um, of uh, importance with uh, addressing climate change and, and health. Um, firstly, uh, um, thinking a, a little bit more about strategy, um, I think primary health care nurses are, are mandated by their professional responsibilities to, to consider the health impact of climate, climate change and the, the correlation of these um, wider health determinants and, and strategize how primary health care services can um, positively influence and support equity focused care. Um, so health care services are, are mandated by PIOLA the Healthy Futures Act, so a, a, a quote from, from this act, which is a, a little bit vague, but um, says that the health sector should protect and promote people's health and well-being by undertaking promotional and preventative measures to address the wider determinants of health, including climate change, that adversely affect people's health. So I think that sort of covers the promo um, promotion of environmentally responsible practice as well as um, being responsible to population health needs. Um, but I think there's uh, room to be for improvement. Um, and the Waitangi Tribunal has recently commissioned their health services and outcomes kaupapa in inquiry, which found that nurses working in the, the primary health care um, work within a systemic framework, which has been found to have significant flaws and not really fit for purpose for achievement of, of health equity for, for Māori. Um, and one of the, the findings of that inquiry was that uh, determinants of health are identified as a, a primary driving factor for um, persistent inequities. Um, and the tribunal noted that, well, if the health system cannot be accountable, accountable for all determinants of health, um, it has um, available to it some of the stronger levers, strongest levers to affect change. So we should make use of them. Um, I'll just uh, briefly just talk a, a little bit, um, give an example of how screening for determinants of health can support individualized care um, for environmental conditions associated with climate change. Um, one of those would be um, in heat stress, which um, can exacerbate cardiovascular conditions, um, conditions such as heart failure, where um, patients that are identified with a, a degree of social isolation or a housing situation which might be um, suboptimal and may not have access to um, air conditioning and um, that might sort of that knowledge might prompt a sort of closer monitoring by um, primary health care services to, to kind of um, 
review um, review medication management, um, some of the, the diuretics and things that they might be prescribed might need to be kind of reviewed in those periods of, of heat stress. Um, I guess there's also um, in response to sort of wider climate uh, associated disasters events, it's, it's helpful to kind of have um, information around vulnerable populations to be able to assist and prioritise and, and reach these populations where healthcare services are, are quite um, stressed. Um, one example, I guess, is um, the recent floods in, in uh, Auckland where there was a lot of pressure put on, um, on uh, hospital services where discharge planning and all that was quite disrupted due to people's lives being disrupted and their homes and, and things. And uh, I think that kind of um, having a, a response of primary healthcare sector can sort of highlight how we're um, multidisciplinary collaboration is, is very helpful and um, in looking at the, the wider determinants of, of health where compromised housing may have economic impacts which um, can influence care planning um, and may sort of prompt assessment of um, early identification of exposure to waterborne disease and um, and environmental things like toxic mold in people's houses. So I guess, um, yeah, it's just a bit of a brief overview, but um, hopefully I haven't actually talked too long, so I'll, um, I'll pass over. Kia ora, Peter. Um, thank you, Peter. That's terrific. Um, let's move on quickly to um, Anna Thorpe and Hannah Moyer from Pegasus. Uh, quick introduction and and thank you very much for making the time for doing this. It's really great to have you here. So I'll leave it to you. Yeah, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, he a mātanga haura um, taupuri uh, ki Pegasus Health a hau um, uh, uh, ko Aina Thorpe toko wangua. Um, uh, nā mihi nui ki a uh, kia ora, I'm Hannah and I'm also from Pegasus Health and I'm the environmental coordinator here as well as studying health promotion at ARA. And if we could go to the slides, please. Um, so this presentation is a very practical one and it's really covering our um, practical journey into sustainability for a big um, primary health organisation in Canterbury um, and uh, so it is not it is not theoretical. I totally agree with uh, with everything that's been said um, earlier, um, but this is really quite a practical application of those principles in in a large primary health organisation. Um, and just the the um, this the slide here shows a cow park coming into Pegasus Health in Christchurch, and um, the man on the left is. Um, is Paul, who's a colleague, and he is our accessibility advisor, and he is navigating this busy car park um, with a 24-hour surgery um, is in the, at the bottom, and he's navigating through this uh, car park environment through uh, into our building so that he can he can work, and alongside of him is uh, a nurse from from the 24-hour surgery, and it really is the intersection of. Um, the, the equity issues that Kimberly was talking about and the, and the environment. Um, so it is all, all interconnected. Uh, this, um, the Manaki Whenua, Manaki Tangata, Hairi Whakamua is, is um, uh, Whakatauki, care for the land, care for the people, go forward. And this is, we've heard a lot about that this morning. Um, and we've also heard about primary care being um, at the forefront of responding to health caused health issues caused by climate change. Uh, we're uh, one of probably the four largest PHOs in New Zealand. Um, we have uh, about 450 
thousand enrolled patients and about 95 different practices and we also we have a very busy and increasingly busy 24-hour surgery and we have I think two mental health um, sort of facilities as well service facilities uh, and we have about 140 affiliated pharmacies as well uh, and we ge- and a lot of community services and we generate a lot of uh, carbon emissions so we've recently completed our um, inaugural carbon emissions assessment. We has had this over our last financial year, which was 2001, 2000, um, 2022. And this was during COVID time. So obviously not business as usual. Our main emitters were um, patient transport. So that was transport via St. John Ambulance between our um, place and also the hospital and as well as the taxi service that we use. And then um, a third of that is also our staff commuting. So that's how our staff get to and from work, which is really huge. And then um, our next one is electricity. So we had a small scope one and scope two and our biggest is the um, scope three and that's where the patient transport and the staff commute um, comes in. So we are obviously looking to reduce our emissions and um, influence what we can. Mm-hmm. So this um, emissions assessment was done for the period during uh, COVID, the, the pandemic, where it was very active and we're, um, and I was expecting a lot more um carbon emissions from waste but actually it was only one percent which was really interesting and so we've got 78 percent with transport which is absolutely massive so we've the the first thing that we did which was really helpful was to join Auditio uh, and to sign the joint call for action on climate change and health And even though it is not legally binding, it is symbolic and it was very significant for the organization and it really opened the door to lots of other things that happened. So it was strategically, it was a great way to start. Uh, The organization also ran uh, some clinical education, a small group education called Health in a Changing Climate for Uh, general practitioners, uh, nursing staff, and um, pharmacists. And um, so there was obviously a lot lot of interest in that. Um, Hannah was um, a student intern with me last year, and this has led to her being um, a coordinator. um, Well, yeah, short, it's a, you know, she works 10 hours a week, which has been absolutely invaluable in terms of getting the work done. we restarted our environmental network, that is to Ohu to Tail. Um, and I really wanted to uh, say that India, your comment about action being a pathway to hope um, is so true in this area. So we have found that our environmental network is people are really positive about being involved. They really want to um, do you know, to join in the effort, a coordinated effort to make a difference. Um, so it's been really helpful. And we've also had people from outside the organisation, including Dermot Coffey, and who's been fantastic. And we've had people from um, Tamana Ora, Community and Public Health, and from Ara. And uh, yeah, so it's, it's while it's not Ora Tayo in itself, it's actually quite an applied um, uh, group and it's been really good, good and part of that is a waste reduction group too. We've been running seminars so we had Rod Carr from the Climate Change Commission come and speak to the staff and it was recorded um, and we've also had someone from Eco Central which is uh, about recycling and that was really interesting as well and we, we have a communications plan at work and uh, so we have very regular communications out to staff and also out to um, pharmacies and, and practices about the environmental work that we're involved with. So that is what, what work we have been doing and now we've got some more work in progress. So we've been working on a high level strategic framework and this will be based around Te Tiriti Waitangi, uh, Te Pai Tata from um, the health um, 
and global green and healthy hospitals. So that's a high level strategic framework that we are working on with senior leadership and it will be based around TTRT and also um, science-based redu um, emissions reductions. We're looking at secure, securing support to join Toitu and Viracare so that we um, are ba based under a national organization to around our, our carbon reduction and also joining Global Green and Healthy Hospitals as they have um, about 10 goals that they work towards. And we'll be looking at working on our procurement guide, um, our electricity usage and things within that. And we're also looking at having an, an ongoing environmental coordinator role as mine is just a fixed um, term at the moment. So we'll hopefully be working to increase my hours and make it a fixed uh, permanent. permanent, sorry. <laughs> um, and we're going to follow the recommendations that we got from our carbon emissions report. And this will include getting a energy usage, usage report. And we're working with the local council to um, bring in an active transport plan and they'll be running a seminar with us to try and um, reduce our staff commute emissions. Yeah, so that's yeah, what that's we're us. working on. So we're at a pivotal point in the organization's involvement with environmental sustainability and uh, in the discussion, I think we can go into some of the, the challenges and opportunities with that. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Kia ora, um, Anna and Hannah. Um, hang around, please. Okay, and Peter. Oh, good, you're together. Interestingly, they hadn't met, but now they, they have. So thanks to this conference. Um, Rick Lomax um, uh, works with Becca. He's going to introduce himself. He's doing some very interesting work. And once uh, Rick's um, finished his session, we'll join up together for some uh, serious Q&A around strategy. These have all been very interesting talks. Thanks, Rick. Kia ora koutou, um, ko Rick Lomax Tokoingoa. Um, so I'm Rick Lomax, Technical Director at Becker, um, covering sustainability and decarbonisation. Um, Becker might know has helped a lot of you know, design work and a lot of strategic work at the um, health, um, in the health sector. Uh, we are a multidisciplinary professional services term, team, uh, which sounds really boring, but what it means is that I think we've got the breadth and depth to deal with major problems that happen in Aotearoa and uh, try and pick up some of the opportunities and really deliver community-based outcomes. So I've been working in sustainability and climate change for about 12 years. Um, as you can tell from the accent, not a natural born Kiwi by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and used to work in the UK, and as David mentioned, used to work in the National Health Service in England, and used to have the privilege of working for the Sustainable Development Unit there. So today I'm gonna to talk to you about some work we've been doing actually with local government. So currently nothing to do with health, but I thought it had some real useful parallels to kind of share the story. And um, it's quite different, but I think really complements a lot of the um, talks we've heard this morning. A lot of them are around kind of bottom-up action, which is absolutely important. Um, I'm going to talk a bit more about a top-down strategic framework. How do we actually embed climate change in decision-making? Uh, and we've been co-developing a solution with two councils in the Bay of Plenty. And the idea being is uh, we can put climate change as a consideration through all of the decisions that is made by local government. So local government gets a budget each year to spend on stuff, whether that's new cycleways all the way through to wastewater treatment plants, uh, all the way through to um, flood protection, stock banks, all the way through to um, you know, building a new library or community facility. What we're trying to do with this platform is put climate as a consideration against that, against those um, opportunities and where money might be spent. Because in the, the day, it's your money as ratepayers that goes into the council's coffers. And we're seeing more and more of an ask around um, transparency around how local government have made those decisions. Um, so what we have been doing is um, exactly what it says on the tin on the slides is it's a platform that's going to be hopefully used um, widely by local government in New Zealand and it flags those risks and opportunities across adaptation resilience and emissions. And it tries to do this at the very earliest stages of a project or a policy, which is incredibly hard because usually there's no detail. It might be uh, an idea in someone's head that actually we know that wastewater treatment plant that we've currently got that serves the community is at end of life in five, ten years and we really need to start thinking about a replacement. 
So it's working with very limited information. We're really good in New Zealand at understanding the climate resilience or the carbon emissions associated with a project when it's done. But once it's done, sometimes that's too late because we've put it in the wrong place and it's exposed to risks. Or actually, we've spent a load of carbon building the thing and we've put it out in the, the middle of nowhere and we've now forced people to drive even further to access the service. So it tries to work at that early, early end with the idea that it helps build what is known as the long-term plan for councils, which is this plan that sets out how each council is going to spend its money over the next 10 years. So we're really trying to work at that really early stages, strategic end of thinking, and really flag where those risks and opportunities are. So um, apologies for how colourful this diagram is. Um, should have done a slightly better job. But this is how the kind of platform works. I just wanted to talk you through it to get a sense. So quite often, the council will have an idea or an issue. So as I said before, wastewater treatment plant might be at end of life, or they think, actually, it'd be really great if we could support individuals from a certain neighbourhood to access this EBD through active travel. It could be as real loose and high level as that. They might come up with a series of different options. You know, is it best for that cycleway to run alongside an existing road corridor, and do we take a lane away from road traffic and give them a cycleway, or do we build a whole brand new cycleway all along the coastline, which would be really aesthetic and beautiful, and get them into the CBD that way? The opportunities and the options that this tool and platform can deal with are really broad and could be, let's say, as quite diverse as that. As it goes through the platform, they put in a lot of information, they tell us what the project is, what it's doing, and it helps flag where an asset or a policy might be exposed to climate change. So that example of putting it on an existing road, if that road is continually being flooded through heavy rainfall events, it will help flag that risk. If it's on the coast, we can have a look at what the flood maps might look like for coastal inundation, for instance, to get a sense of how exposed that might be. So again, we don't have the detailed design, but it's really helping start at the early stages. Uh, and what we've seen from people using the platform so far is it's helped flag that really early on. So instead of getting most of the way down a project and suddenly realizing, oh, actually, did we check the hazard maps to see if coastal inundation was a problem? They've already done it up front. So it's helped in some cases, actually, they've come up with a completely different option or solution to deal with the problem that is sensitive to climate change. So it allows that individual project owner to really understand those risks and opportunities and make the most of them. It can help senior leaders um, understand, you know, if they've got a whole portfolio of different projects, so say they're looking after 50 or 100 projects, they can start to see, well, which projects do we have the biggest risk and which projects are we not taking opportunity to reduce emissions or improve resilience. And in the ideal world, you know, this information will end up in front of councillors so they can see across every dollar we're about to spend in a, in a district or a city council, um, are we actually comfortable that we are supporting where we want to get to in terms of 1.5 degree world, a resilient city or a resilient district? So again, hopefully they have the opportunity to see this information and say, is this really a good idea and is this the best use of public funds? And what we're really hoping will happen is transparency. So this information will be put in front of you as ratepayers. Most long-term plans that councils are consulted on with the public and give you the transparency of how the council have come up with those options and get a sense of, is this moving the city, regional district towards a low-carbon resilient city? So this is um, an example of the output that the platform creates. So this is for an individual project, and you can start to see the breadth of what the tool's trying to do. So it's trying to look at both adaptations, so what's the different... Um, physical risks, so coastal inundation, coastal instability, heat, wind, and drought. But it also looks at the whole of life emissions profile. So the carbon that's being spent from a council perspective to say build a new community facility, all the way through to actually we're building a new road and we're changing the land use for a certain area, which means a developer's gonna come along and spend a load of carbon building houses. Now I'm not foolish enough to say in the middle of a housing crisis, don't build houses. What I'm saying is, of the options around how land could be used in that area, is that the best use of that land? Is there other opportunities that would enable low carbon decision making? So thinking about more intense urban form, uh, thinking about you know, 10, 15 minute cities type principles, it would help flag that different options are more or less likely to support those outcomes. The reason we've um, started to work with local government is because they're expected to, they're being asked to. So national emission, sorry, na Mission Reduction Plan, National Adaptation Plan, in my uh, views, can simply be boiled down to local government make better decisions and solve the problem. Don't necessarily give them the, the help and the guidance to make that happen, which is what we're trying to do with the tool. 
But the bit I'm really excited about is I hope if we can get enough councils using this platform, the transparency about communicating to ratepayers of how this money is being spent and how, if it is or isn't, supporting low carbon and resilient outcomes for your city and district, I think it's really exciting because it adds more information to the conversation as well as more information to support better decision making rather than getting to an end of a project and going, oh, actually, did we make the right decisions all the way through this process? So, uh, I am completely aware this is a health conference and I've rattled on about local government, so I would argue you could take the title of that last slide and put health at the front and we'd probably all agree it's true. So what I'm really excited about is, with it, the tool won't work for health at the minute, there's no two ways about it, but I'm really excited about how it could. So I was really trying to scratch my head over the last few days around, well, how could it apply to health? One, wouldn't it be great if a platform like this would help support to Fat Aurora's infrastructure and estates professionals assess different options, you know, is this the best bang for buck? Are we going to get low carbon resilient outcomes from our spending? Wouldn't it be great if we enabled um, healthcare professionals, you know, from chief nurse all the way down to the floor to assess different carbon and resiliency outcomes from different healthcare models, models of care, healthcare pathways. Imagine if we could see those risks and opportunities. And clinical guidance uh, and medical funding, wouldn't it be great if we could also assess different uh, medical funding routes and solutions and really understand, well, what's the climate benefit or risks of some of these decisions? By creating a pathway, we're actually going to make climate change worse, even though we're going to treat 100 people, are we going to make things worse in a slightly different way? And therefore, how do we manage that downside to make sure we don't actually end up putting 10,000 people into hospitals? Please try again. Please try again. That's me. Thank you, Rick. Um, so we've had four really um, interesting um, presentations in this sort of strategy session. Strategy actually is kind of about a plan to deliver on something. And um, I think that uh, we've talked a lot this morning about what or we've heard indirectly, well, directly too, about perhaps what that plan actually is. And perhaps I could put it to you that um, the, the plan uh, could be called a human and environmental well-being plan. You know, recognising the uh, deep interactions uh, and the intimate relationship between those two things. Maybe that's the plan. Um, but what we've heard in this session, we've heard from Kimberly, who's um, spending... Can we get the um, panellists up on the screen, do you think, uh, chaps? Because that'll be good. Because um, what we've heard is um, from Kimberly uh, talking about an approach to uh, training and students and education. And, uh, and we've heard from Peter, who's actually out on the front lines, dealing with a whole lot of issues as a um, community-based nurse, many of them arising from things outside of health, obviously, that, that will be very difficult for him to process. And, and we've heard from the largest, uh, one of the largest PHOs in the country about um, their strategy to manage their own carbon footprint, which is kind of interesting. And Rick, who's looking at a, a much broader framework for long-term planning, for uh, you know, uh, public services more generally, I would have thought, or or, or a much more sort of um, environmental and human related planning long term. Um, there's a series of questions I'd quite like to ask our participants. And is Kimberly still with us here? Um, I am. Yes. Oh, great, Kimberly. Look, there's a lot of questions that are coming your way, and um, and I'm going to go around and ask each of you a question. And I'm going to pull you together a bit, um, but. Uh, the, the questions really relate to, um, you know, is it just, um, well, a lot of people are really envious of the, of the framework. There's some comments that there is something along those sorts of lines happening at the University of Auckland in one of the courses that's taught here. It doesn't seem to be ubiquitous. Does it just have to be medical students? Shouldn't it be all students? Why isn't it in schools? Um, and just talk to me a little bit about that. Absolutely, and I completely agree. I think obviously my bias is is towards medical students, having been a medical student myself and intimately yeah. understanding that education model. Um, but yes, I, I've been involved with discussing this framework across health professional education. So anybody who is involved in health should be thinking along these lines as well. Um, it is, as I said, I think some of the the schools who are starting to do this and doing it well are really thinking about integrating all of these things, bringing in planetary health, bringing in climate change approaches, bringing in the role of the physician or the health professional as advocate and policymaker, um, and really being very holistic about this. I think very strongly 
that we are doing our communities a huge disservice if we are not educating our future health professionals in this way because they are not going to be equipped to care for the community and to face what's coming in in regards to climate change and the very profound of, uh, impact it's going to have on the health of people. Thank you, Kimberly. Um, I'm going to quickly go to Peter. Um, and Peter, I, I've got a question for you really about your own practice. And, um, and, and how, do you see, um, how do you see your role as a primary healthcare nurse responding to so many of those issues, the social and environmental uh, issues that actually impact so much on, uh, on people's well-being? How do you, as a, you know, as a clinician working with those individuals and their whanau, manage that uh, and the difficulty of all of that. So just talk to us a little bit about that. Um, well, it, it is it is complicated, um, uh, but um, I, I think the, the more that you um, focus on, on some of these um, broader influences, um, then you can kind of sort of, you're not blind to them, so you can um, ascertain whether whether you can, um, hope in some cases, perhaps you'll be able to even um, sort of do something positive to um, break down some of these these um, barriers to to um, the health and, um, and and such. But um, just having that knowledge, I, I think it can direct your your approach of, of how you interact with communities, families, on a um, on an individual level. Um, so that's having that information for the um, assessments that you're doing on an individual clinical level. But that, um, that also broadens out into sort of the, the um, wider perspective of, um, of whether, how um, services can be, can be run to provide for, um, provide for these, um, to account for these um, determinants of, of health and things and, and their um, where people can be perhaps sometimes a little bit left behind or it can be difficult to, to access access here. So it's um yeah, it's really having the, the thought behind it, I think, which has um been a bit of a, an eye opener for me the, the more that I'm sort of um, starting to focus on it is of how um how relevant it actually really is and um how the more kind of thought and understanding that goes behind it, how um how we can sort of realign provide it's, it's a kind of interesting thing isn't it that um, that that very confronting uh, situation that so many care workers find themselves in dealing with the consequences of things that are really hard to control you know that um, they can deal with the issues the immediate the immediate consequence but the causes of those consequences continue and and that can be quite a, re a really difficult thing and it's kind of good that you've uh, you, you, you've teamed up with the Pegasus crew to your left mm -hmm. there um, and you know it'd be interesting I hope you sort of stick closer you're a, uh, Peter works for Nurse Maud actually which is a an organization of Community nursing that I think started in Christchurch. It's, it's gone. It's in many other countries, uh, many other cities of New Zealand now. Um, I want to turn to the you, um, uh, Hannah and Anna, uh, and Pegasus, which is a huge organisation. And I'm kind of a bit surprised that um, you're the only big primary care organisation that's sort of embarking on this work. And why why do you think that is? And, and what 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 was it that got you into the space that you're in now. Obviously you've got some backing from your board and, and, and your members, but um, why do you think others are not doing it? I think partly it's it's not really knowing how to do it and having a model or, or an approach that is um, is, is working. Um, hang on, and I hang on a minute, that... hang on a minute. Can you hear that? Yeah, you can. Sorry, it's just me. <laughs> So, and I think primary care has been really busy, um, and particularly from COVID, just like with you know many spaces, and people's gaze has been down delivering services um, rather than looking up, looking ahead, and what is coming really quickly, and how that's going to affect all of us. Um, so I think it's partly that, um, and partly not having. Um, having a sense of of what to do, um, but we have really found that that our staff and our supporters, the allyship, um, they it has been really positive. People really want to be involved. So I think the time is totally right for doing it, for getting involved in creating something with momentum, and people will want to be involved. Um, 
it, it has been really useful having some support at the senior leadership table um, because, uh, you know, like uh, like everything, it's uh, there is money to be spent and there is money that's needed to be spent um, and that's actually going to increase uh, and we really need champions um, in different teams and different area sectors and, and definitely champions at the senior leadership table who will support the allocation of resources. Thank you, thank you very much, Anna. Um, Rick, I'm gonna ask you something. Um, people are asking about, there's a couple of questions here about whether the framework is likely to be available to more councils. So that's question number one. Okay. And that's probably an easy answer, which is? Yes. Yes, I thought so, that's rather good. Uh, the second answer already relates to taking that leap that you're suggesting, that this framework may be something that ha may has a, have a more ubiquitous utility across um, longer term planning for other groups. And, you know, and obviously we're talking health here. Um, uh, and um, what, what, what do you intend to do on that front? I mean, I'm saying that looking at my colleague, Debbie Wilson, sitting in the front row there, who's working um, for Te Whatua and the infrastructure group, and maybe there's a conversation to be had um, there. So what, what would you like to see, um, Rick? Cool, uh, it's a very open question, so I'll do the best to answer it in a non-politician's way. Um, to be honest, I think uh, Kimberly actually gave us a solution around those kind of six, seven different principles of embedding into the curriculum. It's the same for decision-making. So if we have all of these frontline staff understanding that from day one around their education of what they need to deliver to be a sustainable, equitable, low carbon healthcare system, and if we have that decision making from the top down, those two things are going to meet in the middle and probably create a pretty epic healthcare system that I think we'd all be even more proud of, because um, it will help prioritize things like prevention. Uh, Ihirangi mentioned before around, you know, let's look at... Um, promotion, health promotion, illness prevention rather than illness treatment as a theme that came through Kimberley's. And like, I think we all know sat in the room that's the right thing to do. Unfortunately, a lot of business case decision making across New Zealand and, and wider, when we start to look at those things, it boils down to cash because it's the easy thing to measure. And then we start to think about sustainability and it boils down to carbon because that's the next easy thing to measure. And then we look at all the other dimensions of what a sustainable healthcare system really looks like and it's really intangible. And what we've found with this tool is it's helped bring the knowledge of decision makers up. They now start to understand some of the terminology around climate change and resilience, which is really good. And it's slowed down decision making by half a millisecond for people to pause and go, is this the best use of funds? And it's not about dragging out the decision to take 10 months rather than 10 weeks. It's just around some additional considerations that need to be thought about. And some of the kind of pivots and changes we've seen in local government around, oh yeah, there's no point doing it in the way we normally do it, because that's not delivered what we want, it's not delivered what the public wants. And it's those sorts of win-win-wins that I think are equally transferable to health, any other sector, private business. Uh, the tool in its current form is, is not fit for health, but always open to a conversation around what that looks like. Thanks, Rick. Um, we haven't got a lot of time left, but I'm going to whiz around and ask the same question to, to each of you. And so, um, Kimberly, I'm going to ask you, what is it, what's your key message, um, uh, having heard, been here this morning, taken part in this panel session, what's one key message I'm going to ask each of you to do that quite quickly, if you can, that you want people to go away with? Absolutely. So I think one of the really big things, uh, and this is climate change and health more broadly, not just education, is that so often you hear the conversations around climate change and the impacts being, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't drive a car, you can't eat meat, life will be more difficult if you follow these principles. And really, it's the absolute opposite. So I think this is about creating a happier, cleaner, greener, healthy, more equitable society. And it's a really good thing. And it's a thing that has really good economic benefits. It has health benefits. And when we discuss any of these things, we really need to sell it in a very positive framework because it really, it's what's best for all of us if we present it in the right way. And that's all I'll say. Cool. And you've provided us with a very good framework. So thanks for that. Um, Peter. Um, I, I think I'd perhaps I'd like to make the point that um, it's, it's very important for us to acknowledge that we're all in this together and that um, we work better collectively collectively and um, and uh, and that uh, if you feel like you're sort of needing to um, take on such a, a big 
big um, area on your on your own. It can be very overwhelming. It can bring up a lot of negative um, emotions, and and you can feel quite powerless. Um, but as as some of the um, we've already discussed it with the speakers this morning about um, how it's, it's not about just one um, one person working individually. It's as how we kind of work collectively to sort of um, yeah improve things. And cool. Thanks, Peter. Um, Hannah. Anna. Um, I would say two things primarily. One is collaborate. Um, collaborate regionally. Uh, or collaborate organisationally, regionally, nationally, and secondly, to use frameworks that have been developed that, um, so that it, it just, yeah, I really like using frameworks, so we're, we're evidence-based and we're kind of going, going in a similar direction. Yeah, it's like tapping into the resources that are already there, such as the support of Aotearoa or um, becoming a member of Global Green and Healthy Hospitals, as I've already got all the procurement guides and the waste reduction guides that you can build on from there. Cool. And um, Rick, last comment. Uh, I think my punchline's been stolen slightly, but it's, it's hope and action. I think I'm really positive around the kind of reform landscape we're currently in. It's a bit scary, it's a bit different, nothing happens overnight, but I really think it gives us an awesome platform and also owners in to do things differently. Uh, no pressure team to deliver on that one. Uh, but I also think we are all part of the system, whether we're at the front line or at the board table, we all have a sphere of influence. And it's just making sure that we stop for two seconds and say, in this current situation, what influence can I have? And what do I think is the most meaningful impact I can have and act on it? I really think it's all about hope and action. Cool, thank you. Um, well, I'd like to thank the panellists on, uh, for their um, kōrero this morning and thank um, all of the speakers this morning. It's been a, a really good start to the day and um, particularly want to thank you for being here. Thank those people at, in uh, uh, Ōtūtahi and Ōtipoti and in Tamaki Makaurau uh, for their perseverance um, and joining us remotely. And uh, lunch is outside and Hopefully you'll be back here at half past one on the dot, so enjoy that. Thank you. <laughs>